Hi, welcome to the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, uh, number episode number 14. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books on what I call pre-digital pop culture, things like pulp magazines and old-time radio. And with me are... My name is Jess Terrell. You might know me from the Facebook discussion group, For the Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs, where with Lilla Pop, uh, my fellow admin, our group's founder, uh, we talk Edgar Rice Burroughs 24-7. We'd love to have you all join us. And I'm Scott Stewart, freelance writer, uh, freelance editor, uh, jack of all trades, and uh, really look forward to getting to do these shows with uh, Tim and Jess. Mm -hmm. And tonight we're going to be doing something a little different. We're actually going to be recording fan commentary for a couple of the Johnny Weissmuller uh, Tarzan films. Uh, the films we're doing are Tarzan Triumphs, made in 1942, and Tarzan's Desert Mystery, made a year later in 43. Um, these are the only two films made during the war, and both uh, key off the war for their plots. The, the first one is going to be foiling Nazis, and the second one, Tarzan, is going to be on a mission to help the Allied war effort, although I think the actual villains there weren't not weren't Nazis, they had their own evil plan going on. Um, but, but it's, but it's uh, getting something for the war effort that gets Tarzan to where all the adventure is. So they both key off World War II. Um, for, these were the first two movies made by RKO uh, f with starring Weissmuller as Tarzan and Johnny Sheffield as boy. Uh, there had been six movies made at MGM who at this time sold the film rights for Tarzan to RKO. And Weissmuller and Johnny were a part of that deal. But Maureen Sullivan, who was um, playing Jane, uh, had a long-term contract with MGM, so she didn't come along for that. So she, we, we will no longer see her as Jane. Uh, apparently, she was actually kind of sick of playing the character and was perfectly happy with this. Um, and I don't know if she just wanted to move on as, as an actress or if she didn't care for the films. I don't know her backstory, but uh, she wanted out anyway. So Jane doesn't appear in either of these films. Um, there's going to be references her to, to her being in England, you know, nursing her sick mom in the first one and helping as a nurse with the war effort in the second one. And when she finally does return in the post-war films, she's going to be played by Brenda Joyce. Um, and I think that sets up the films pretty well. Um, we'll be talking about the events of the films as we watch it. So if you are listening to this podcast, the idea is for you to have the movie, whether you're streaming it or on DVD, keyed up and ready to go. And when I say now in a few minutes, I'm gonna be hitting play. So uh, have the movie playing at the same moment with the sound down and the subtitles on, and uh, you'll be able to hear our commentary in sync with, in sync with the actual movie. Um, you guys ready to go? Or is there anything else you wanted to say before we started? If I may, good may jump in uh, real quick uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, Maureen O'Sullivan's uh, disappearance from these movies. My understanding is she had a separate contract agreement with MGM, so mm -hmm. it was not an easy thing for that studio. It would have been a separate business transaction, I suppose, for that studio to transfer her over to RKO. For mm -hmm. whatever reason, they elected not to do that, and as you stated, uh, I understand also that she was tired of playing the Jane role. So yeah. uh, that was the easy way out for her. Right, and, that, and there's no reason to think she disliked the Tarzan, role, the Tarzan films or the characters or anything. I, she may just have wanted to move on as an actress and do different things. Uh, avoid but, being stereotyped, I would suspect. I would suspect, yeah. For uh, Johnny Weissmuller, who is personable on screen and fun to watch and a great Tarzan, he didn't have a lot of range as an actor. I, I suspect he was perfectly happy being stereotyped. Um, in fact, he went on to Jungle Gym which is uh -huh. just Tarzan wearing a shirt after, <laughs> after he stopped doing the Tarzan movies. That's so, true. Yeah. So, so he, he, knew he was in his wheelhouse with this. And I think, I think he was probably perfectly happy with it. And Johnny Sheffield went out into doing Bomba the Jungle Boy after this series. Am I remembering the time frame correctly? Yes. Yes. So, so they both were at home in the jungle as actors. Yeah, and uh, to my understanding, Sheffield did not do any other film work. Uh, after the Bomber films went away. I, oh, okay. I believe that's the only thing he did. Oh, okay. So, uh, well, a lot of child actors do leave the business um, and often have successful lives 
in other other areas. So I hope he did well. So um, okay, so are we ready to start? I am. Okay, Sorry. so so for those of you who are listening, in a moment when I say one, two, three, go, hit play on your DVD or on your streaming service, and you'll be able to hear the commentary along with us. So one, two, three, go. And we're, we've got the RKO up. Um, I need to make sure that I've got the sound down and the subtitles on, which I do. So we're looking at the um, RKO uh, logo and now the credits, Tarzan Triumphs. Um, and unlike modern movies, the credits are gonna be re relatively quick before we move into the movie, just like the end credits, just flash. You don't get 15 minutes of end credits like you used to. Um, I kind of wish movies would go back to that. Quite a lot more people involved with all the special yeah. effects. I, I, I got to say that, that I, the Indiana Jones films, in particular Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, reminds me of a Tarzan film for several reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and when those, of course, those films are much more recent. For one thing, they're in color, and, and you get to see the lush area that they're in, mm -hmm. whether it be Temple of Doom or, or, or the other films. Whereas here, it is black and white, and that's just, while black and white normally doesn't bother me, that just does not do the jungle justice, I don't think. I would like you know, to see the green and whatever colors might be found in the jungle. Yeah, I, I get that. I usually prefer black and white, but I can actually understand that. That's a nice seg, though. There, we were watching the credits were showing the shadow of the leaves on the elephant, and then we just go to live action. It's actually a nice little segue from the credits into the live action. Um, uh, and so we start with Boy being disobedient as he's going off when Tarzan told him not to leave the house. Boy seems to do that a lot. There's sometimes I think where Tarzan should just preemptively spank him every morning on the assumption that he's going to do something wrong. Uh, 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 do we know why Cheetah was called Cheetah in the movies rather than Nakima, which was the monkey in the book? I, do, do we, does anybody have any idea why that's, why that's true? Well, I can only speculate. I think once again, it's um, Hollywood thinking they can do it better than Burroughs did. Yeah. So, um, and it is kind of interesting that for six movies, they've lived pretty near this lost civilization and they've never mentioned it before. But uh, um, there is Boy getting himself in trouble. Um, Boy actually is quite capable in dangerous situations. He's not a bad character at all, but he does um, uh, move the plots along often by doing something he shouldn't. Like falling off a cliff. Like falling off a cliff there. Yeah. But, but, but one of the things that appeals to me about this movie is a lost city. I love lost cities. And oh, I do too. Andrea really is, is a pretty nice lost city. And the mm -hmm. other thing is Frances Gifford here is now coming into view. I think her performance is, is superb. Yeah. Now, they may have been thinking of her as a romantic interest for Tarzan, either somehow getting Jane out of the picture or, re, or, or having her appear as Jane in later movies. This, this was kind of a test to see how she played off of Tarzan. I think she actually does rather well myself too. I like her performance, um, but they didn't bring her back. I guess the studio heads didn't think she worked out. She so. had some other experience in Jungle Adventure. She did a, a, a serial called Jungle Girl, not to be confused with the Burroughs film or story. Uh, and I have not seen that, although I'm expecting it to come into my mailbox someday soon. I have seen the sequel to that, which I'd forgotten she was in it one of the best serials I've ever seen. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the uh, title of the series of the sequel, but it is a, a Clayton Moore is in it too. It is a superbly done serial. Um, and the Jungle, Jungle Girl actually was, uh, they paid a licensing fee or whatever. It was bought with the idea of being an ERB name or property, mm -hmm. but they went way off of anything he ever wrote. Yeah, it was basically an original story. Uh, that, um, but they do introduce her character well here. She doesn't know Boy at all, but she immediately risks her life to help him. So they immediately set up that Zandra is one of the good guys, and it's someone we can like and admire. I also get feeling, or to me, in the movie, I think she's better fit with Tarzan than I, I know we've seen this discussion online a lot, than mm -hmm. Law. Because... Mm -hmm. Because Law has that, 
a sort of a, a uh, inherent, if you want to call it evilness in her. Yeah. Get you on know, with the that, sacrificing yeah. and all this. Yes. And Get I, on. I, I, I really, uh, I really like the uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. way they have her in, in this movie and, and being like a princess in a lost civilization and, mm -hmm. and everything like that. Yeah, that's true. If our wives get mad at us, we might sleep on the couch. If Law get mad at you, you're going to be a human sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you can sleep us on the altar. If you're lucky, yeah, you'll you sleep there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you um, may pass out. The noise mm -hmm. to come back. Yeah. Um, I suspect this is a studio set, what we're looking at here, but I think it looks really nice. That is one advantage of black and white, is that you could do these tight little sets and hide the fact that it's a set really well. Um, so I, I get what you say about color for the jungle, and I largely agree, but black and white does have its advantages. Especially if you're doing a low-budget movie. Because that's that this scene here of the him lifting him up the cliff, that just looks cool. Yeah, it, it, I agree it does. It's, it is well done. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is a search and rescue uh, uh, problem here. How do you get people off the side of the cliff? Yeah. Um, and yeah, boy's gonna get yelled at. Um, just go ahead and spank him, Tarzan. He deserves it. So, um, and I like that they do a nice bout. Like the whole point of this movie is that Tarzan initially is a complete isolationist. He just wants to be left alone. And they set that up, but, but without making him a jerk about it. He's friendly to Zandra and he's sincerely grateful for helping Boy. But it's just you know. We want to be alone in our house and we're waiting for Jane to come back and that's it. Um, so uh, Weissmuller had a lot of charisma in this role. So he could do that without, without becoming dislikable, um, if you see what I mean. Uh, regarding Cheetah, I'm, I don't know why they picked that name unless it's just so they had an original one uh, that they could use across the board, but all the movies use several different chimpanzees as cheetah, depending on the tricks and uh, mm -hmm. uh, stunts they may have to do. And in mm -hmm. the, I think as in the Bricks Tarzan movie, they actually, the uh, uh, chimpanzee or the monkey in there is is called Nakima. Okay. I never pictured Nakima as a big chimpanzee like cheetah is. I always pictured him more of a little like spider monkey guy. Yeah, uh, yeah I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. The way they the way they did them in the uh, animated Tarzan in the sun. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking, that's the yes. only time. That's the only time Nakima. I think maybe the only time Nakima had a screen presence was in that animated cartoon. Um, one of the best representations of Burroughs Tarzan. Um, I agree. Yeah. Um, so yeah, because uh, here we, you know, the Burroughs Tarzan is a literate, multi, you know, a poly, you know, polylingual, speaks a lot of languages, reads and writes. Here he's got to have boy read to him and um, still does the meet Tarzan. You know, he's a, he's a different character. He's a fun character in his own right, you know, and we get great movies with him, but um, we never, ex we, we, he's just not Burroughs' Tarzan at all. He is, you have to accept him as a different version of Tarzan and then yeah, just yeah. enjoy the movies on those levels. Yeah, I read an anecdote about Johnny Weissmiller talking about doing the movies here. Because he, he wanted to do some things where he could expand more, uh, uh, like the Jungle Gym, but he's looking at some, hopefully to do some Westerns and war movies. And someone asked him about the dialogue. He says, well, he goes, one day I was on set, and I was supposed to say, um, uh, run away. And I might be, have the wrong words, but run away. And he goes, instead I said, run away quickly. And the director <laughs> stopped the filming and said, look, Tarzan doesn't use long sentences. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, that is good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I recently watched, I reviewed it on my blog, a movie called Swamp Fire from the late 40s, where he and Buster Crabbe were in it together. Yeah, yeah good, he was fun playing, movie. A fun movie, yeah. He was playing a, a naval or a Coast Guard officer. Um, and you, know, you can see he doesn't have a whole lot of range as an actor, but he still plays a likable role in that, in, in that movie. So he could... He could be more expansive if you had let him. Um, yeah, and, and Swamp Fire it wasn't Jungle Gym, but I enjoy the yeah. Jungle Gym movies too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, those little guys look more like what I picture Nakima to be in the book. Yeah. I recall the first time I saw a Jungle Jim movie, and I was amazed to hear hear Johnny Weissmiller come. To, and I was quite young. Please understand that. But I was amazed hearing other more complete sentences than what I was accustomed to with him. <laughs> yeah, you get locked on the characters uh, as a kid, <laughs> and you indeed. And you, yeah, I remember as a child, I would see the show Ironside with Iron Richard Burr in a, uh, a wheelchair long before yes. I saw a rerun of Perry Mason. And I was shocked when I saw Perry Mason and saw him walking along. I didn't know he could walk. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Now, mm -hmm. right here, Cheetah here has been accused of stealing. And this is mm -hmm. something that comes up not only in this film, but in the Tarzan's Desert Mystery as well, and probably other films too. So this is something that uh, we'll see again. And it seems to be a habit of cheetah, which sometimes helps out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so, <laughs> so uh, that was see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Yeah, saw. I noticed that. That was that was actually kind of cute. So there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we were talking earlier, Jess, we were trading messages on Facebook earlier about whether uh, Tarzan and Jane ever got married in the movies. Um, and I suppose they could have between movies, but um, I don't think they ever overtly said so. Uh, you know, well, we'd have to watch the movies and see when they show Jane in the club, in the treehouse, is she sleeping in a different room or not? <laughs> that, uh, like, like two beds, like the deal on Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and that's and that's my failure for not researching that as thoroughly as I meant to before we started our podcast here. Mm. The um, uh, I, I've, I, there might be a scene in one of the silent films where uh, they get married. There's that possibility. Uh, the thing that always irked me uh, that the lack of the alleged lack of them being married is what led to librarians banning the Tarzan books for a while, whereas one. This shows that the librarians didn't read the books, or else they would mm -hmm. know. And two, uh, I always view the movie, to, and not everybody is going to do this, but I think of the movie Tarzans as being in their own little alternate universe, whereas the, yeah. the, the Tarzan of the books has his. Uh, that, that's the ERB universe, as I see it. Yeah. Now, back to our movie here. Here comes our villains, and they're yeah. getting ready to do an airdrop. Yep, and it's, it's a great way to introduce the villains. They, they give a, a rational reason for why they want to control the lost city of Philandria, because there's oil and tin there. And mm. their, their method of capturing it to parachute in because it's almost inaccessible and build an airfield is also reasonable. So they're not there just to be evil. They're there with an actual purpose, which I think get, makes for a stronger, a stronger story. An evil purpose. Yes, it's an evil yeah. purpose. Doesn't, doesn't make them any less immoral than they are. They're still Nazis. But they're not just, you know, blindly taking over the city just to do so. They have a they have a reason related to their war effort for doing so. Um, there were and, a number of places throughout the continent of Africa mm -hmm. that the German troops did go into to try and expand upon the territory. Oh yeah, during World War II. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the the Germans were always hurting for a source of enough oil and enough uh, raw materials. So this actually makes perfect sense. Um, that they they would do this to get us to get that source, um, and here's another cool scene. I like this with the guy's going to get um, caught on the plane, and um, this this was a job hazard during during um, during a parachute drops like this. And there's a similar scene in one of the Abbott and Costello movies. If memory serves, it's the Air Force film "Keep Them Flying," where a um, a, um, uh, one of the jumpers gets caught in the wing like that and they can't figure out how to get him down. Yeah, you, and you would occasionally have, you know, a string of parachuters go out on a combat drop. You'd occasionally have someone who did slam into the, into the uh, horizontal elevator back there and the stabilizer, I think it's called. And that was that. So it did happen. Uh, but it explains why this guy's well separated from everybody else. And... Um, we get another example of how Weissmuller's Tarzan is different from uh, ERB universe Tarzan because he doesn't recognize this guy as a German at all. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, the Burroughs Tarzan would be worldly enough, even though he preferred the jungle, 
to recognize this guy right off. We are about the 14 minute mark. I know the timestamps in various scenes. So if anyone's mm -hmm. uh, keeping score with us, we are about the 14 minute mark. Yeah. And we're going to see a reason uh, here, like these were low budget movies, especially at RKO, which specialized largely in B movies. Um, we're going to see an example of how good storytellers could do a good scene, even if their budget were low. Um, you know, that's, they're obviously putting in some stock footage there. But they also obviously didn't have the budget to show a plane crashing. But the way they do it here, where we're going to hear it over the radio with them yelling and the, the sound of the plane crashing and then it abruptly cut, cuts off is, um, is actually very effective. So it's an example of how the storytellers who made B-movies could work within the limitation of their budget to still present the scene effectively. Now this part I like. You get, Tarzan, you got to have some Crocs and Gators. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think probably in the books, other than lions, he may have, and other than what he killed for food, for self-defense, he probably killed more crocodiles. Except for lions, crocodiles was probably the beast he had to kill most often. I think so. Well, this came a little natural to Weissmiller with him having been a, a Olympic you know, swimmer. Yeah, um, I think they purposely tried to get water scenes in whenever they could because they knew as an athlete that was one of the strongest things. Um, yeah, I'd forgotten. He actually doesn't kill a crocodile here. He just saves uh, Schmidt there from them. So the crocodile can reappear later. Yeah, if this would still been at MGM, they probably could have just stuck in stock stock footage of a previous crocodile kill from one of their earlier films. Yeah, um, but here they just um, he just pulls them out in the nick of time. Yeah, you know, boy's supposed to be doing schoolwork every day. He doesn't recognize the guy as a German either. <laughs> so he just needs to bone up on his geography, I guess. But, but he, well, right, right, right. He does recognize the language is not English right about in here when the, mm -hmm. when the uh, German begins to speak. But you're yeah. correct. Yeah, but once again, we have Tarzan. He's very isolationist. He wants to be left alone, but he's not ignoring a wounded man. Um, so... So the, once again, they have that talent of still making him a likable person, even though his goal in life is just to make everybody leave him alone. And I think he was supposed to represent American isolationism before the war, where we were all, all hoping we wouldn't get involved. And then Pearl Harbor kind of demonstrated we couldn't, not, we, we were going to have to get involved. And I'd read in one place uh, that he, the U.S. The government had actually uh approached so lesser about in combining some american propaganda and anti-nazi propaganda in a tarzan movie in some form and this was the completed answer to that okay so uh, they may have even funded part of it i'm not positive they may yeah they may have because this was the sort of message you wanted to get out to people that you know, we, we, tried to, we tried to just leave it alone and let it stay in Europe, but it didn't. So we're gonna have to fight now. And so they brought Tarzan along that same journey. He's, you know, even after Schmidt here is killed a little later on, uh, he still wants to be left alone, but eventually realizes he can't, that it's going to involve him. Um, but the isolationist theme does show up, perhaps not this pronounced, but it does show up in prior uh, Tarzan mm -hmm. films from the Weissmiller era where uh, he'll say essentially that uh, people come to the jungle um, to kill the animals and cause mm -hmm. disruption and he doesn't want them there he's we've seen him we've seen him literally destroy hunters rifles when they come wandering into his his area yeah i think in, in this case though it has more of a direct political metaphor to it than it did in the past so 
Um, but we saw we saw Tarzan taking the coil off the radio, or Sheeta taking the coil off the radio, which will be a plot point in a little bit. Um, these guys are keeping Sheeta again. Yeah, these guys are keeping their uniforms awful clean for tramping through the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 coming up here is uh, I think it's coming up is a uh, noteworthy line where we see a leopard mm -hmm. and a boar go at it in a fight. And yeah. the piece of yeah. dialogue is um, the strong always wins, mm -hmm. which we'll, we'll, that's a theme that we'll have repeated here later on. Mm -hmm. So I just stole somebody's thunder, sorry, but I wanna make sure we know that. Oh no, that's, that's okay. Um, we probably should have announced at the beginning that we will be doing spoilers sometimes as we watch this. So, so that's inevitable. <laughs> yeah, we're going uh, all the way to the end. Yeah, um, we we are at the twenty minute forty nine second mark in the time in the timestamp. Go ahead. Okay, and this it's really effective storytelling. Just when you think about how much story they've gotten into the movie so far in just that twenty minutes, uh, it's another skill that the that the makers of B movies in the thirties and forties and fifties had was to be able to tell the stories in a very succinct manner, and get an awful lot done. That. A modern movie will often take two and a half hours to get the amount, the same amount of story in. Well, in my opinion, this is one of the best Tarzan movies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not just the Weissmiller era, but all of them. I, yeah. I really like the way the story's put together. The film moves. It's 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 intriguing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's well acted. Uh, Mrs. Gifford there is a very strong actress, mm -hmm. and uh, just I, I really really like this. Yep. Yeah, the um, reviews were very strong on it, saying they considered to be the third or fourth best of all the Tarzan movies at that mm -hmm. time and and it was very profitable too. Mm -hmm. So for a movie in the books when Tarzan finds a lost civilization he often has a opportunity to learn the language. Here they're going to in a few in a minute they're just going to come up for a justification for why they can speak English which I think is the grandfather there spent some time out in the world yeah. before right. he came back. Apparently, English just caught on with the city folk there, with the Palandrian people. But they do give a justification for it, which I think is a nice touch. Um, we've all been trained by Star Trek to think that everybody speaks <laughs> English, no matter how far you go. But it's the nice universal when, translator. Yes. <laughs> but it's nice when they actually think of those little details. I think, once again, it makes it for a stronger story. Good point. This sergeant here that I'm seeing on screen now, uh, he is played by Sig Rubin. And I have to say, I fall into the trap of stereotypes here. I, I tried hard to separate him from John Banner, who played the Sergeant Schultz on uh, <laughs> Hogan's Heroes. I still find some similarities there. Yeah, but uh, Ruman actually specialized more often than not before the war. He was of German descent. He emigrated to the States in the 20s. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually fought for the Germans in World War I. Um, but he specialized mostly in comedic roles. And when the war started and they needed people to play bad guy Nazis, he played them a lot. But I think he always did bring this comedy sensibility with him to an extent. So, so, so thinking of John Banner when you think of him is, is kind of almost inevitable. Well, I'm glad you said that. Now I don't feel so guilty. Mm -hmm. So, but I, um, kind of like uh, a, another thing, way of, of uh, getting the anti-isolationist theme here is to bring the Germans in pretending to be friendly at first and then really slamming down on the people of Calandria, you know, giving them no choice but to fight. Um, so I think, I think it was a, it's a good way of telling the story. And I think it was also emphasizing that you can't trust the Nazis and you can't not fight the Nazis because uh, you're gonna be in a position where it's either fight or lose your freedom. Well, in addition, Colonel Von Reichert here, who's played by Stanley Ridges, has an ulterior purpose. He's got his eyes on uh, on the Francis Gifford character, Xandra, mm -hmm. uh, beyond just uh, occupying her city. Yep. So, and, oh, this smile! Look at look at that smile there. I know she is gorgeous, isn't she? So, yeah. she she shot him in the eye, and she'll regret that one. Yeah. 
yeah, you could just see, you can see Sig Ruman's comedy sensibilities are just always below the surface, even if he's, <laughs> even if he's supposed to be playing as uh, a, one of the villains, um, th it's there. So it's, he's, he's, he is an early version of Sergeant Schultz. There's, there's no way to get around that. Just as a World War II addict, I will have to say that the RKA studio did not have proper German weapons in their, in their props department. <laughs> uh, and the weapons here look fine, but they're not anything the German army actually would have had um, in real life. So, and it goes pretty quickly to Polandria is now, the people of Polandria are now forced to be doing slave labor to, uh, um, you know, build the first to build the airfield. They need to bring in reinforcements and connect back with Germany. Um, so uh, they, the Palandrian people, take the same kind of journey out of isolationism that Tarzan does, because um, they've been living in peace for centuries. They don't even think about the visiting Germans, uh, worry about them at all that they might turn out to be bad guys, despite the fact that they're all heavily armed. And at the end, they're going to learn that they have to fight. It's just really the, the very strong theme of the whole movie. One thing that impressed me, because I've got the copy you're showing here, too, through uh, Amazon and, and the other Desert Mysteries, they've done a really nice job, whether they're restored or not. These are very clean prints. They are. They uh, just, really, they uh, really happy to see uh, mm -hmm. for an older, lower budget, black yeah. and white film, how clear it was. Yeah. How do the DVDs, like at least one of you owns the DVDs, right? How do they look on DVD? They I, I think they look just as clear as this. I, I okay. have uh, all the Weiss Miller films. Cool. Um, and I like, once again, we see Zandra is brave. She's standing up to these guys to try and do what she can for her, for her people. As we've talked about before, most of his, uh, if you want to call it female leads or uh, associated women in, in the, in the uh, Edgar Rice Burrow books mm -hmm. are strong women. We've talked about that quite a bit. And, yeah. brought that over in their movies here too. They do, you know, like, like the women in the books, she's gonna to need to be rescued from time to time, but she is obviously courageous and she's obviously smart. And um, um, and she's just thinks first and foremost, she thinks of her people. Um, so it's she can't help headband. but admire her. It, it's all in the headband. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is our brother who just stepped in. Yeah. Uh, he paid, paid the price for that intervention. Mm -hmm. his, his, uh, that was Stanley Brown who played the character named Achmed. I, I believe this is the first movie where they had a lost city of non-African um, natives. Mm. Um, mm. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure they did that in any of the MGM films, but I'm not going to say that for certain. Let me know if I'm missing something. I'm almost at the end of that. Mm -hmm. I do have a thing for Lost Cities. Yeah. Now, one thing we see, we're going to see also in the final fight scene, wartime movies did not, movies made during World War II never ignored the fact that good guys suffered casualties as well. Um, and you probably couldn't ignore the fact there were too many people in real life who were, you know, getting telegrams that they'd lost a loved one in combat. But uh, to the movie's credits, you know, the, the, their theme would often be, we have to fight the Nazis, there's no choice. But they never hid the fact that there was a terrible price to pay for that. One of the silent films, and this might be Tarzan the Mighty or Tarzan the Tiger, Mm -hmm. uh, I believe invokes Opar, which of okay. course is a, a solid or solid is a uh, okay. Pulse. Well, the, but the, need, this might be the first, this might be the first one in the Weissmuller continuity. Oh, then. oh yeah, that yeah. that that I definitely agree with. Mm -hmm. 
And, now, I, and what I just said, I, I need to look further before I, I to be okay. sure of what I said. Okay. You know, I just thought earlier, uh, Cheetah was listening to music on that radio. Exactly. Where is there a radio station close enough broadcasting she, popular music? She tapped in the Gridley Wave. Yes. <laughs> 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 Abner Perry plays all the hits out of Plooster every day. <laughs> well, you know, if Perry could build a radio station and a, and a record player, he would have done it because he invented anything that came to mind. <laughs> so he would have invented rock and roll music if he thought of it just because he invents stuff. So, Maybe he did. Maybe he, he did. Have. In that fictional yeah. universe, that's a, that's, a, actually, that's a good idea. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've written a short story. That's a good yeah. idea. It might be a real short story, but that's an <laughs> idea. Now, is Cheetah here actually consciously foiling the Nazi, or is he just being his unusual annoying self? And and by happy coincidence, foiling the Nazi. So. Yeah, I think it's Cheetah being Cheetah that... Mm -hmm just turns out to be a really good thing on Tarzan's behalf by the time you get to the end of the movie. Yeah. Although he does seem to put things, hide things in certain ways. Mm -hmm. They do give, uh, there'll be a scene coming up here fairly soon with Tarzan and monkeys covering him. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. That shows a form of communication or intelligence, mm -hmm. and knowledge of, of doing an intentional laugh. Yeah. So, um, and here we had another scene of Tarzan determined to be just isolationist. He won't let the guy call for help. He's not leaving him stuck there. He says, I'm going to get you back to civilization. But, you know, he won't let him use the radio. So, it's kind of interesting that it's the German who explains isolationist theory to Tarzan. Um, I don't think that has any meaning. I just, it's kind of a, a, a kind of an irony. It, well, I, I think it's an interesting point, though. I, I had that had not occurred to me. I'm glad you pointed it out. I think it's also to the benefit for the audience, just in case there's anyone sitting in the audience who doesn't understand what the issues are here. Yeah, that's true. They're making it very clear. Um, right. Yeah, and the and the movie is just it's it's understandably because it was made during the war. It's just very anti-isolationist. Um, Back to my earlier statement about Lost Cities, I have now double-checked. Tarzan the Tiger, mm -hmm. silent film with Frank Merrill as Tarzan, was based on Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what I was thinking of. But to your point, this is the first of the Weissmiller era having a Lost City in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I recall that... The, the sergeant here misses, and then he blames the fellows behind him somehow. <laughs> you do kind of now, expect him to just say, I know nothing, I see nothing at some point, don't you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, right through here, there they are, still holding hands. Um, the Tarzan and Xandra were holding hands, and we do see them um, touching at, mm -hmm. at various points during this film, which... Yeah, so it might have been that they were going to, if if the studio heads had felt her chemistry with Weissmuller had been strong enough, mm -hmm. uh, would they have recast her as Jane or would they have actually taken Jane out? Because Edgar Rice Burroughs tried to get Jane out of the picture once and the editors of the magazines wouldn't let him. And, so, and then, and then the, the movie people actually tried that also. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Tarzan, I believe it's Tarzan. Mm, Tarzan finds a son. So in that movie, Jane gets seriously wounded and they filmed two endings. And, no. and one ending, and one ending, she died, and mm -hmm. they, they ran through a, a test showing, and the audience had a very negative reaction. And Burroughs was saying, uh, "Don't do this. This is not going to work." But they did <laughs> anyhow. Fortunately, they, they had two endings filmed. They went mm -hmm. they, to show it to a test audience. It was rejected. So when mm -hmm. they released it nationally, then they did show uh, Jane surviving that. But yeah, that was the thought because they wanted mm -hmm. to open up some some romantic roles. Now, yeah. whether they would have recast Francis Gifford as Jane or where they would have kept her in the Xandra role, I, I, I don't know. My opinion, yeah. what she's doing here is, is fine. I think they could have worked with that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm uh, not in the movie business, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we saw two of the Germans die a rather uh, gruesome death there, um, but with uh, piranha. Um, I like yeah. when they call them cannibal fish. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I instantly knew they were dangerous when I heard that as a young, even as a youngster. Mm-hmm. Oops. Um, yeah, so the sergeant survives, but it's it's actually a story point that he survives because he's going to bring more Germans back with him. Now, didn't they often use Indian elephants with fake ears because the right. Indian elephants were easier to train, right? That's correct. That's, yes, they did. They, yeah. they give the Indian elef- elephants the ear job. Yeah. And my understanding is that's why cheetahs and chimpanzees, because chimpanzees are easier to train too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unless you're Mike Henry, you get bitten in the chimp. And you get bitten by one. I know. I've seen a picture of that. That was pretty oh, gruesome. Yeah. yeah, it was gruesome. I agree. I really shouldn't yeah. make light because that, that does look serious or did mm-hmm. look serious. Now, um, we were talking about getting rid of Jane, the later movies, uh, Tarzan's Greatest Adventure, and I cannot remember who starred. It was the, just before Mike Henry. Um, they, it was pretty obvious that Jane didn't exist in that continuity. And then the Ron Eli uh, TV series, they just didn't kill Jane off. It just apparently in that version of the, that parallel Tarzan universe, she just mm-hmm. didn't exist. So, um, so there is a temptation amongst Tarzan storytellers to leave Jane off sometimes. Oh, poor Schmidt. This is a pretty undignified way he's going to be going out in just a moment. As I know he's a Nazi. We can't really feel sorry for him, but... You know, pretty brutal probably, for, a, for an older think, movie, too, like yeah. this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he joins the military probably hoping for, mili- for, uh, for um, military glory. Um, and he's going to get killed by what? The baby elephant? So... Kind of, yeah. So. There it comes. Mm-hmm. That uh, Tarzan's Greatest Adventure was um, Gordon Scott, by the way. Gordon Scott, yeah, it's actually an excellent movie. Um, oh yeah. Very young Sean Connery was one of the villains in that. Yeah. Good point. Good point. And Connery might have been a Tarzan, but things didn't work out. So yeah. He did. He did a spy movie instead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he and doesn't look was, like a spy. <laughs> Several spy movies. Yeah. He ended up disliking the the James Bond role eventually. I wonder how he would have felt about doing Tarzan multiple times. Because that would have typecast him too. I don't know. Tarzan with a Scottish accent. He could never hide his Scottish accent. <laughs> so. well, they could put Tarzan up with the Highlanders when he goes back to England. There you north, go. North of Scotland, yeah. <laughs> And Tarzan, this is the new brave heart. <laughs> and and this is something we do see periodically in the Tarzan movies, particularly the Weissmiller era, where uh, one of the jungle animals uh, mm. wreaks the revenge, wrecks yeah. the, or just distributes the revenge uh, or the justice, as yeah. opposed to Tarzan himself. And in this case, here, bully is coming to Cheetah's uh, rescue. Mm-hmm. And he actually knew to knock the gun out of the guy's hand first. That's yeah. one smart elephant. And then he doesn't even show up in the next movie. That looked like a little bit of stop motion there. Him falling off the cliff. I like how they throw in there, not just Nazi, but Nazi hyena dead now. Mm-hmm. So they're getting the full animal kingdom. These guys are really bad guys. Yeah. But it's interesting that even at this point, Stars, Tarzan's still not ready to go to war. Yeah. He goes, well, okay, he was a Nazi, but he was bothering me, but he's dead now. So Nazis aren't my problem anymore. So it, it really needs to be emphasized with him several times. Um, Probably another well, parallel. I think it'd be true to the char- character with him being raised the way he was, where yeah. as when they were in danger of that they'd attack, he, he doesn't go out looking for a fight. Yeah. 
we were at the 39 minute mark in our time stamp. Uh, another thing that keeps popping up in this film and also in Desert Mystery is, is Tarzan's um, um, uh, jungle cure-all medicine. I think it's better than Granny's rheumatism medicine. That's true. Yeah, he, he's got his jungle first aid here. And in the next movie, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, he goes yeah. to collect stuff to make an anti-jungle uh, fever medicine that they need in, in London. Um, so, um, so, yeah, they do show him as quite the medicine man there. And, and humor does come, come into this, like uh, here, Tarzan and Boy are discussing where they're going to sleep. And at some point here, um, Tarzan says, good thing elephant sleeps in the corral. <laughs> <laughs> but I also wanted to remark, I meant to say earlier, Tarzan and Boy have a very warm uh, relationship, very warm. They're buddies, in addition mm -hmm. to being father and son. Yeah, which, they do. Which was a good role model for me when, when later on when I became a parent, was trying to figure out how, how to approach parenting. Mm -hmm. And now our sergeant's getting chewed out for not doing the right thing, even though he came back to report status, and didn't mm -hmm. have any weapons, didn't have any help. Yeah, had piranha in the way of him and his goal. So... <laughs> right. <laughs> So, uh, soldiers of the Reich never let it rest. So <laughs> so here is Tarzan, you know, still refusing to get involved. And he does also, I guess what he said right there, you know, Tarzan protect boy like Jane say. So he also does have the legitimate concern of, of honoring Jane's wish to make sure that boy stays safe no matter what. Well, most so, definitely. And, and earlier when he was fussing the boy about not doing his homework, uh, mm -hmm. Tarzan said something like uh, Tarzan mother now, Tarzan knows what's best. Jane said you study, so you study. Yeah. Tarzan may not understand the details of the lessons, but he knows it has value. Yeah. Okay. Now here we get to the beginning of the plan for Xandra to kind of flirt with Tarzan to get him to change his mind. And I just keep, you know, gee whiz, Tarzan, Jane's not dead. She's just away yeah. for a little while. <laughs> and, 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 and I want to yeah. take this opportunity to give some relationship advice like I did in our discussion on Monster Men. This is a terrible <laughs> idea. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. If, you're, if your wife, spouse, girlfriend, significant other is ever gone, mm. never, never let another woman get in her, her closet. And wear yeah. clothing. I mean, you'll be mm -hmm. lucky if you live. Yeah, I know. Yep. And Tarzan can fight lions single, uh, you know, yeah, single handedly, but uh, the, you know, a woman scorned is the wrath you don't want to face. All, all obstacles fall before <laughs> an angry woman. Yep. And, and, you know, and Boy's not helping out here, too. He, 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 put, he put her up to all this. Yeah. I'm a little surprised to him. If, if, if Jane ever finds out, he's in trouble. <laughs> True. <laughs> They're all, they'll all be sleeping in the corral for quite a while. Oh, yeah. So, so, but of course, if their goal, if their consideration was for Francis Gifford to be the new love interest, I can see the producers wanting to put this in um, for the sake of once again, seeing whether they like their chemistry together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I can, I can, I can see that. But... I will also say in 1942, 1943, society was a little more conservative. So mm -hmm. there's already been questions raised about Tarzan and Jane's marital status. Now here's Tarzan messing around with somebody else. Yeah. I wonder, I, I guess you could, well, it's a weak excuse. Now you could say, well, we don't know. We, you know, they're not, she you never actually married Jane. So there you go. But that would be pretty weak since they're obviously committed to each other no matter what. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. But but about that chemistry though, I mean, watching them swim together here, they're having a good time. I'm yeah. granted they're actors, yes, but they're having a good time. You can see it. Mm -hmm. I know. I would, I would have. So, I would have. 
if they'd kept her around, I would have preferred to have her recast as Jane in later movies. But uh, um, now, of course, Brenda Joyce, who eventually takes the role, also, I think was also a great Jane. Mm -hmm. So, but I can see Frances Gifford as being a good, uh, a, a good Jane on a regular basis and playing off of Weissmuller really well. Well, in my opinion, she could be Jane or Xander as long as she keeps the outfit. I like the outfit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Tarzan, he, he might speak in monotones, um, but he's no dummy. He tumbles to what she's doing. Well, and, 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 and that's another point I was going to make. He has strong principles. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those is loyalty, is, well, not only loyalty to Jane, but the principles about the, uh, his isolationism and, and not wanting more people to come in. Yeah. And now she's doing, you can, uh, you know, get to a man through his stomach theory. Yeah. Oh, this is this is relationship advice item number two. <laughs> I love this of line. Of course, uh, another <laughs> it looks good. Another slight difference between uh, this Tarzan, the Weissmuller Tarzan, and the book Tarzan is that the book Tarzan preferred preferred his food raw, whereas Zandra there apparently cooked something. Unless she was just making a salad. I'm not clear on what he's eating there. I'm so Well, he is using a fork as opposed to his hands. That's true too. Um but if uh um I could see him like using the fork even when Jane's not there because he knows Jane expects him to be teaching Boy to eventually be a little gentleman. So Good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder, I'm going to have to ask around about this one, if uh, Johnny Sheffield was ever approached about playing Tarzan when Sheffield became an adult, as opposed to the Baba films. I don't know. That would have been interesting. Yeah. Um, I have to look into he, that. He was getting pretty close to being an adult by the time the Baba films ended, wasn't, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah in my yeah. opinion, he was uh, into his, I mean, we can find out, but I'm sure he was into his 20s easily. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking latter 20s. Yeah. See, when news breaks, Cheetah knows what's going on. That's true. Yeah. This, I think this is probably a set, right? As, a, as opposed to a location. This little beast of jungle here. I'm not sure. I, I think it's a set. I, I think yeah. it's a set. So this is a case. Once again, I, I I agree that it would have been nice to get a color jungle, but this is a case where black and white really makes the set look better. You're I think you're better able to accept it as a real jungle than uh, than if it were in color. It's kind of. I think it's actually kind of cool that boy is wants to go back and fight the Germans on his own. He probably has a little bit of a crush on Xandra there. And actually, that could be a motivation for some of the things he has done, because he likes Xandra himself. Yeah. I mean, he's young, but, but, that's, but that's not un, unheard of. Yeah, no, well, that's an age, I mean, it would be kind of a schoolboy crush type thing, but he's at yeah. the age where he can easily get a crush on a, right. on a, on a grown woman. Right, and it's not every day a good-looking girl comes into Tarzan's jungle. That's true, too. And he's probably old enough here to start uh, noticing girls on a, you know, I'm starting to hit puberty level too. So, but uh, it, even if he's not quite that old yet, I was madly in love with my second grade teacher. So, you know, it happens. Mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, if my math is correct, Johnny Sheffield began his first Baba movie at the age of 18. No, and okay. Did, and did the final one at the age of 26. That's plus or minus a year. Give me a little. Oh, okay. Time. Those films ran. Those films ran. The first Bomba film was 1949. The last Bomba film was 1955. Sheffield mm -hmm. was born in 1930. Don't tell me. 
1931. Okay. So that's why when I said latter latter twenties, I was thinking you were 27. If my mm. math was right, that's 26. So okay, that's not what I was thinking. So it's kind of like the uh, what the Bowery Boys, where they clearly weren't teenagers anywhere anymore, but they kept making movies with them together. Right. Yeah. Right. Abbott and Costello films, which I love, but mm -hmm. oftentimes they're referred to as the boys. They're usually men in their forties. <laughs> yeah, which you know the term boys may have had a different use. Uh, yeah, back in the nineteen forties, but I sure yeah, don't think of boys. Yeah, and then Costello's uh, comedic persona was always childlike, anyway. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, he did. Johnny Sheffield was uh, mm -hmm. also tried to get a series called Band to the Zebra Boy mm -hmm. on TV, but they couldn't get okay. sponsors. Now here, I think it's actually important that we see the sergeant being rough with boy there, and we also see him getting killed later on. I think they deliberately put in a scene to remind us that he's as evil as the rest, so that we wouldn't feel sorry for him at all later on when Tarzan throws a knife into him. Good point. You know, because he was kind of that, he had that kind of Sergeant Schultz persona. We might have mm -hmm. actually not thought of him as being as rotten as the other Nazis and disliked it when Tarzan killed him. But they put this scene in here to show him roughing up boy and that kills our sympathy for him. So that's a very good point. I'm mm -hmm. sure you're right. Watch us not too long ago with my wife and she goes, what did he do? Did he, she goes, did he slap boy? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. And, and right she's before, like, she was astonished she did it in a movie like that. It's like, well, they're trying to make them look evil. She goes, doing a good job of it. Yeah, they are. Well, but, slaps like that were fairly, not that it's right. I mean, not to, mm. to, uh, not to excuse, I don't mean that. But slaps like that were not uncommon in movies in the 1950s and 40s. Mm. Yeah. I forget the title, but there is a film where this uh, man and woman were the last survivors in the city after some major disaster, they last people alive. And she's all upset. They run into each other. She's all upset. He says, there's nothing to worry about. I'm not going to hurt you. Within 30 seconds, he slaps her. And he just absolutely <laughs> slaps her to quiet her down. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to hurt you. Whack. So, well, that used to be in movies and TV, it used to be the standard thing to stop someone from panicking was to slap them. Right, right. Well, they do eventually wound Tarzan here, but th these guys went to the Star Wars Stormtrooper uh, Academy, uh, uh, Marksmanship Academy. <laughs> he wasn't that hard a target out there. So, Oh, that's a good line. I wish I should have followed that. That's a good line. But now here's all the jungle animals coming in here to, to take care, to cover Tarzan's backs and front, so to speak, mm -hmm. which yeah. we were alluding to earlier. Yeah. There's some communication and intuitiveness going on in the with with the jungle creatures in this movie, and your, I think probably your typical Weiss, Weiss Miller era Tarzan movies. Mm -hmm. All the monkeys are looking innocent, <laughs> but we're just sitting here. <laughs> we're just sitting here, guys. We don't have a thing. We know nothing. We see nothing. Right. Yeah. So they take boys. I like that point too, where they said if he'd fallen here, it would have scared the monkeys off. Oh, yeah, that's just, true. That's yeah. true. That's a good point. They just have no idea about Tarzan's rapport with the animals. So taking boy with them, that's going to end Tarzan's isolationism. Oh yeah, setting us up for a mm -hmm. big line. Yeah. Sandra conveniently sees all this. Here comes Cheetah. We are at the 53 minute mark, uh, timestamp mark for the movie. Okay, yeah, so once again, we have the very concise storytelling. Um, 
because mm -hmm. I don't think we have more than about 20 minutes left, but they're going to get the, the rest of the story very effectively told in that short period of time. Right. Well, I haven't timed it, but I think the Weissmiller films typically run about an hour and 20 minutes, I believe. Mm -hmm. and, this, and this one clocked in at an hour and 16 minutes. That's my, by my reckoning. I don't have the official time. Yeah. And... Of course, these were often shown as double features, so um, um, keeping the movies short enough to be able to put two of them together along with the cartoon and the newsreel and the Three Stooges short and all that was was a part of what, uh, you know, part of just how the movie business worked at that time. Right. But you're right, you did, you did get all those extras, like the, like the previews and the short mm -hmm. and the cartoons. Yep. So no, there's some good acting. Good. Yeah, he's not he's not he he's not the most wide ranging actor in the world here, but you just really feel his concern for boy at this moment. And then the anger it turns into. And, and this would be the line right here. Yeah, where audience cheered. Tar now Tarzan yeah. make war. Um and and Weissmuller pulls that off. You know, he's he's obviously utterly terrified for boy, and then it turns into ang right, you know, kind of a righteous anger. And then that's that. And and from this point on, the pace of the movie, which has always been good, picks mm -hmm. up. It, it really turns does. It up a notch. Yeah. And you right here, he quickly dispatched the guard, and there's more to mm -hmm. come. Yeah, and I I I think the next guard he takes out, I really like the methodology he uses. Um, catching the guy in the rope and then using him as a counterweight. Yeah. To lower himself down. I mean, that's that's a real Tarzan move. I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. It shows them moving through straight through with Seth to, uh, mm -hmm. to do the mission he's on. Yeah. It's a little unusual, and I've not kept any kind of account, but to see uh, the white smeller Tarzan use something other than his knife as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and then he's just going to let the guy drop, isn't he? <laughs> so I tell you, if you, know, you get on Tarzan's bad side, his tactics are going to be brutal. Um, you just don't want to be on his bad side. Because he gets it done, though. He does. He does. And you know, and, he, and it, this is all planned. He sent Cheetah ahead to find out where Boy is, so then Cheetah can show him where Boy is. So um, um, it's it it all flow in terms of the Tarzan universe. We're we're visiting here. Everything makes logical sense. It's a very well told story. Uh, a note of irony, albeit tragic irony is that Johnny Shuffle died 10 years ago and he he died falling out of a palm tree. Oh, ouch. Oh my goodness. 10 so years ago, he, he must have been about- and, Pruning it in their yard and, and I just, uh, just was interesting when you're looking at all the trees and the jungle stuff, you know, the kind of ironic fall out of a mm -hmm. jungle or a palm tree. He must have been about 80 and he was still climbing trees. That would be, a, yeah. And down in Chula Vista. Mm -hmm. There for a short time. Great weather. And then take a moment to show that machine gun set up because that will be important to the plot a little bit in a little bit. See, a part of me thought that Tarzan should have commandeered that machine gun and carried it around with him. Um, but, there's, there's instead, a, he just yeah. There's a the the comic the Dell comic book adaptation, or it might have been Gold Key. It's Gold of Key. Tarzan Untamed. The the I think it was a George Wilson cover. Yes. Of, yes. That's yeah. that's one of the of Tarzan holding a machine gun and firing it by hand. Um, mm -hmm. You know, based on a story set in World War One, uh -huh. is is just. 
yeah, it's just one of the most wonderful comic covers ever done. I but, agree. Yeah, it's a pretty yeah. iconic one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, and when and I was consulting for the Burroughs collection uh, mm-hmm. uh, over at uh, the University of Louisville, the um, I, I, I said, be, make sure you display that comic, which they did. They've got it on the wall over there. Mm-hmm. Um, and once again, we just see the Tarzans. The, the Nazis are evil. They're, they're threatened to make Tarzan surrender. They threaten to shoot boy. And um, the sergeant, again, was obviously going to do it. So again, we, we're stripped of all the sympathy we might have gotten from him, from him being a slightly comedic character earlier. And that had to be deliberate. I believe this is also the first Tarzan movie where they shifted the time and for the audiences during World War II, it was a contemporary story as opposed to being either late 1800s, or early 1900s in the other. No, that's uh, a good Tarzan. point. Universal move, did the same thing with their Sherlock Holmes series so that he could yeah. battle Nazis. So, and that's, I think, is a very, like, this is one case where Weissmuller and the book Tarzan are the same. His refusal just to say anything at all, just to look stoic and refuse to answer the German's question, I think that's the same thing the book Tarzan would have done. Yeah. There's there's there's, some classic questions, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's when he shows some emotion is when boy is in danger. It's just, that, that, that's, Weissmuller's best uh, moments as an actor in the Tarzan movies is when he shows real concern for Boy um, and for Jane in the movies she's in. Uh, he, that's, that's one thing he pulled off easy. He pulled off really well, rather. Good point. Yeah, she doesn't succeed, but I think it's awesome of her to want to like to try and knife the Nazi. So she is, so we once again see she's both strong-willed and brave. Reminds me of the scene at the table in the uh, last Tarzan movie when Jane's looking at pulling that knife and uh, uh, using it against um, uh, in the white hat, and I can't remember his name now. <laughs> uh-huh. In the Legend of Tarzan from a few years ago? Yeah, Legend of yeah. Tarzan, they're on the riverboat, yeah. and she mm-hmm. tries to get the knife to, uh, to yeah. stab him. It's another, another example of a proactive Tarzan. That's not a perfect Tarzan movie, but that Jane, the portrayal of Jane was one of its strong points, I thought. I like, I like that movie a lot. Mm-hmm. And Cheetah's actually going to be responsible for rescuing them, isn't he? Cheetah's talents do extend beyond comedy. Mm-hmm. This is a dismal scene. They're all wrapped up now and waiting for the firing squad. Yeah, and I like the way this is done. We hear the people yelling outside for Xandra to be freed. Then we hear the machine gun fire. We know something horrible has happened, that it's actually more horrible and that we don't really see it. Um, it's um, it's a very another very effective piece of filmmaking. That would be, Cheetah just picked up the radio coil that was. Hit. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now he's on the he's he's um, on his way back to have his big hero moment. He moved through yeah. the jungle quicker than Tarzan. <laughs> yeah. How close is Paladran Paladran to the Tarzan's treehouse? I don't think they ever say, but uh, you yeah. think if Tarzan. Well, wasn't aware of it when she saves boy to be ain't it have to be quite a ways away, but yet 
they seem to be able to travel it fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so suddenly we discovered there's a lost city next door we didn't know about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just never happened to go down that one old jungle path before. Yeah, I wonder what's going on. So, um, I'm a sucker for lost civilizations and hidden uh, villages, mm -hmm. <laughs> kingdoms. So that was the sergeant sleeping over there on the couch. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Peter returns to radio coil. Now, I when I watched this movie a few days ago, I, he's going to go back for Tarzan's knife in a moment. I was wondering why he, how he knew where the sergeant's room was, but he just saw it there. So I, yeah. I thought there was a minor plot hole, but I was wrong. He does, he does know where, uh, where the sergeant is, and therefore knows where to find the knife. Chris, how did he know where the sergeant's room and the radio was in the first place? A scent. I followed the yeah. scent. Yeah, okay. Why not? It's Yeah, it's reasonable. Yeah. Can I say I pulled that one out of the air? Yeah, <laughs> but it's not a reasonable, it's not an unreasonable um, assumption. All right, there was the knife uh, snatch just now. Mm-hmm. That was probably that's probably a dull knife prop right there because no matter how well the tr uh, <laughs> trained the chimpanzee is, you you, know, you probably don't want him uh, fumbling around with a with a really sharp knife at that moment. Might be more than a rope skate caught. caught. <laughs> I appreciate that little turn to the head there that Weiss Miller just did uh, mm -hmm. to, to turn his eyes away from the knife in case it goes awry. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Very that was a nice touch. Um, and there's the end of the poor sergeant. And sergeant dies at the 106 mark. Time okay. It's a good Tarzan move with the knife, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then Tarzan's going to be using some pretty clever tactics and it's secretly letting cutting loose the people who have been selected for a firing squad mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, you know getting and getting them ready for a sudden uprising um, I like where they show them having the strength to move mm -hmm. originally I thought they're you know wood that is rods a, but there's supposed yeah. to be metal rods that he a steel that he could actually uh, uh, bend through to have that extra strength mm -hmm. that is a nice touch well, someplace in the Burroughs books, and I need to double check this, but Burroughs says that Tarzan has a strength of 10 men. Yeah, he rips uh, gold bars out of a window in one lost city, I think. That might oh, yeah. Be John, that might have been John Carter. I, uh, uh, it's, it's Tarzan. There's a Joe Jesco artwork of that very scene. Oh, okay. It, okay. It's in one of the latter books. I want to say it's in, it might be Forbidden City. Okay. I, I, I have looked that up before because I've used that in the post. Mm-hmm. These sequences are great now where he comes up on so many of the soldiers. Mm -hmm. Real, uh, uh, they're the prey and he's a hunter. Yeah. And he just disabled. I mean, you know, I don't think Weissmuller ever does use a gun in any of the movies, does he? No. So, I don't think well, other so. than tear him up. Because mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm just thinking that machine gun might have come in handy um, well, uh, for the good guys. And that was my point from earlier that it could have been useful. Yeah. A little, a little awkward to carry, perhaps, but could have been done. That's true. But then on the other hand, he would have had to have gotten one of the Palandrians up there to use it. So it might have been wiser to disable it. All right. You know, so we, we may be wrong in second-guessing Tarzan. But he is using good tactics here. Um, you know, getting them loose so they can jump the guards. And... Um, then there'd be a general anti-Nazi uprising in the city. It's really a pretty cool action scene. Right. Well, and, and he's using stealth here. Instead of running mm -hmm. down the main street yelling, um, trying to take on the entire army by himself, uh, he's, yeah. he's being very quiet about it. Mm -hmm. They did just hand over a machine gun there. You, yeah. You, you uh, use yeah. This. 
yeah, the Palagian the Palagianians don't have any problem. I mean, they were a peaceful people, but I guess they've lost any any um, any uh, uh, attitude of isolationism themselves. There, they know they got to fight. I like that the little double take that the coil is back on the radio. Why did Cheetah bring that back? Was he just being Cheetah again without knowing any better? Uh, my, good question. I don't think it's really explained, but I think Cheetah understands that Tarzan's in prison because of that radio coil. So yeah. if it were, were returned, and Cheetah's been fussed at for stealing things, mm -hmm. if it yeah. were returned, perhaps they'd let Tarzan go. I mm -hmm. believe that's the, the reasoning that was going on inside Cheetah's mind. Yeah. Not that we have in chimpanzee terms, but. Yeah. Now, I think this is a really well done battle scene. And I mentioned earlier, the wartime movies made in America did not hide the fact that good guys died too. We see a right. number of Calandrians go down before the battle is over. But, um, is for a peaceful people who haven't fought in forever. They fight pretty good when they have to. They got their backs to the wall. They do. Is their city's been invaded? Mm hmm Okay, now I Is have my... to object. I have to object to this scene coming in. There's a little continuity <laughs> error when we see the machine gun there it, in the long shot. It still had the ammunition drum on it. Just a slight continuity <laughs> error. Um, but um, you know, just. Making Cheetah a marksman with a Tommy gun is just, that's just a little bit too much. I'm sorry. I, I, I do not accept that. <laughs> that's, but how, how do you think movie audiences would have reacted to that? I, I don't know. They might have just laughed. Um, that, you know, it, it, it might just be me, but I, I really wish, I, I think Cheetah's used fairly well in this movie. But that was a that I just have to say that was too much for me. So the person we're pursuing here is the um, where'd my roster go? Um, the major. The, yeah. Major or Colonel, the commanding officer anyway. And if he gets away with the radio, he can call more Germans. You're right. So, right. And I like, I actually don't mind Boy getting a shot in, you know. I was sort of surprised okay. by that. I'd forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Colonel von Reichert, that's who I was trying to think of. Yeah, okay. I had a roster over here and then I changed screens and I lost my roster. Mm hmm. But uh, Tarzan just using kind of psychological warfare on him to keep him in a panic and use up his ammunition and his pistol is another great yeah. tactic. Mm -hmm. And I could see the book, tar the book Tarzan using the same sort of tactic. He, mm -hmm. often, used, he often used psychological warfare mm -hmm. um, uh, against the bad guys. Yeah, you know, I, I, would, I would call it, well, I'll call it jungle warfare. Um, yeah, techniques where where you shadow, where you shadowing your opponent and harassing mm -hmm. them, picking yeah. off picking off a, 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 a target here and there, mm -hmm. uh, which instilling fear. A lot. Uh, Tarzan was very good at that in several of the um, of the books. Yeah, the Return of Tarzan against the uh, mm -hmm. the Arab slave traders who raided the Wazari is one of right. the best examples of that. Well, um, and with the uh, native villages too. Not to mm -hmm. take anything away from the Phantom, but they. They had the ghost who walks. He was considered like the uh, white ghost or the ghost of the jungle spirit or whatever, because he would appear and do something to one of them and then be gone, and they didn't know who it was and what was happening. Mm -hmm. We're about um, the one hour, 12 minute mark in the film. Yeah, coming up to the end. I'm kind of surprised when he meets his doom in a minute that they didn't reuse the piranhas since they had already established them as existing. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a very good point. You know, so, because um, they kind of just have the lion happen to fall into a pit nearby. Oh, how convenient. Mm -hmm. um, it's still an effective ending, but I thought it would have, you know, yeah. if I'm going to armchair quarterback the movie, uh, reusing the piranha might have seemed a little more natural. 
I, I agree, since they were established. And that's uh, not, yeah. uh, lions are a dime a dozen in Tarzan movies and books. Yeah. And, and I like it, don't misunderstand. But the mm. piranha is kind of a twist. Yeah. You could, you could have gotten a lot of good yelling and screaming out of that, too. You would have. Could have shown his skeleton floating up afterwards, too, if you wanted to be. But yeah, the lion just happens by and just happens to fall into a convenient pit, too. So. I always thought the, the uh, lion was responding because of the noise or the scent of them being actually, out here. like Yeah, actually, like that. yeah, that's reasonable. So uh, I, I just envision that lion standing in the dressing room for the entire movie waiting for his big scene. He comes in and falls mm -hmm. in a pit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how does Tarzan get his knife back afterwards? So. Strong always win. There's, there's that uh, theme repeated. <laughs> that's the true. Again. Yeah, that was a neat line. I, and I think the ending joke here is actually kind of funny. I mean, I it, date, it dates the movie with the, you know, with the Hitler insult they do, but it's it's an honestly funny one. Well, it is a World War II movie. Yeah, and I guess I think insulting Hitler probably never gets old anyway. It's a Tarzan moment. I remember first time I saw this movie, I was probably eight or nine, and that this ending that coming is coming up has. Stayed with me for fifty some years. Is <laughs> <laughs> the Fuhrer? That is funny. So, she pose. <laughs> okay and that's the end that is tarzan triumphs um and so a year later we had uh tarzan's desert mystery let's see there we go um are you guys ready to jump right into it or do we have anything else to say about this movie before we move on well, I was going to respond to a question, not really related to the movie, but just in general. Mm -hmm. uh, what snacks are appropriate? Well, we're at intermission, so to speak. So uh, <laughs> your question is, what's, what snacks are appropriate while watching a Tarzan film? Uh, I suppose technically it would be raw antelope, but not many people want to want to snack on that. <laughs> well, I was thinking in terms of jungle juice, zebra mm -hmm. burgers, man-eating plant salad, and ostrich <laughs> eggs omelet. <laughs> Well, we get some uh, we get some uh, shots of uh, what I guess are supposed to be dinosaurs in this movie. So you can always have some uh, some uh, uh, dinosaur giblets or something. So, dinosaur eggs. Dinosaur eggs. That would be great. Just, uh, you guys both have closer access than I do to alligator tails. So. Well, that's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a delicacy right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had it when I was down in Orlando years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you guys might be hearing my ice maker throwing out some ice for my wife in the background. So that's <laughs> so. If, so if that came across on the recording, that's what that was. Um, yeah, yeah. Jess, I think we were we were talking about whether or not Jane and Tarzan were married. Uh, one of us came up with, you know, why didn't they do with what in the first movie? Why why didn't they do what they did what Rose did in the book and just have her dad happen to be an ordained minister and just do a quick one minute scene where they showed him getting married. It would have um, all the like moral outrage over them uh, being in the jungle without being married would have been cut off right there. Exactly. Everyone loves weddings and mm -hmm. uh, it brings out the romantic in all of us. That's always been a popular topic. It only takes a minute or so. Or if nothing else, just say something. You should have, have, her, have Jane show off her, her wedding band and say something like, I, I loved our honeymoon, something like that. A couple yeah, of you could have done it between movies. Yeah, exactly. Something like that, yeah. So um, yeah, it's odd that they never did that since they were getting criticized for that and it would have been such an easy fix. I agree. I agree. Somewhere in the back of my mind, something is floating about. I'd read one time that the studios didn't push it because for the international audience, they didn't really need it and and they'd be more open to it than if we had 
if the movies had had like a Christian wedding or something. Okay. I could be off base about that, but it seems mm -hmm. like I read something like that a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, right. I know the first one I think was made just before the Hays Code went into effect. Um, so you could be a little more risque than you could, you know, even just a year later. With, with later the swimming movies. scene, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, but they never s did seem to get around to getting married in the Weissmuller universe. Um, but in this next movie, Tars uh, Jane's still going to be off away in London, uh, helping with the war effort. Um, are we ready to go? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, so those of you who are streaming or watching the DVD along with us, um, in the in the podcast notes, I will post the exact timestamp uh, if you want to jump ahead to this movie at some point. Um, as, as, um, but. Uh, I'm going to start it in three, two, one, go. Okay, and let me make sure I still got the subtitles up. And I believe I still got the sound down, and so we're ready to go. So we were watching 1943's Tarzan Desert, Tarzan's Desert Mystery. Um, I do like the title cards RKO uses too mm -hmm. for, for the movies here. And yeah. It just gives that pulp feel to it. It does, doesn't it? Um, and we have Nancy Kelly playing what Connie, I forget the character's last name. Um, but uh, she, she is not really a love interest. She has some rapport with boy in this. Connie Bryce is the character's name. But uh, they don't play her up as a love interest at all. She's just the nice looking female who happens to be involved in the adventure. Yeah, she reminded me more of the this is a, a slam against her, but she mm. remind me more of the uh, uh, female co-lead or whatever guest star you might see in an Abbott and Costello movie or Marx Brothers or something yeah. like that. Bob Hope I, and uh, Bing Crosby. I can see that character type, like the vaudeville performer involved in a spy mission. That would have fit yeah. perfect into a Hope Crosby movie or a or a Costello or Abbott and Costello movie. So. Um, I agree. If they were looking for a replacement for Maureen O'Sullivan and were trying out Francis Gifford, and mm -hmm. with this film, they, they shift over to comedian, I don't mm -hmm. think she has the appeal that Ms. Gifford had. I don't uh, know. She, 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 uh, she would not have worked as a regular character. I don't mind her as a one-off character. I do like the character. But, yeah, she does not have the appeal or the chemistry with Weissmuller to, um, to make, it, make her work on a regular basis. Her, her, one of her things, um, approaches, is to use hip vernacular of uh, mm -hmm. whatever the going phrase is, uh, yeah. probably among the, among the, I will say hip generation for want of a better word, even though we're talking about 1940s. Um, and I don't want to say that gets old, and, and, and if I have that feeling, it's because I've seen the film so many, many times. Mm -hmm. but, but you, you do have, and grant, granted, it dates the film a little bit, so you do have to say, what is she saying? <laughs> have to interpret well, her. Yeah, the character might have gotten old if she'd been a regular. Um, <laughs> right. And, yeah, and I think that's true. And I could see somebody thinking she, they gets old even within this one movie. It doesn't bother me that much, but I can see somebody having that reaction to her. So, well, I, I think it, I think I may say that simply because I've seen this movie two or three times this week yeah. preparing for our discussion. That mm -hmm. that's probably where I'm coming from. Yeah. Um, now it's interesting. Tarzan doesn't like the outside world, but he's got mail service arranged to get you know letters yeah. <laughs> airdropped to them. So let's look here from Jane. Yeah. Probably about the only person he's interested in getting a letter from. Probably. And uh, maybe Jane has enough pull with her relatives or whatever back home to get somebody to to make the plane ride. <laughs> There's got to be some costs involved. Someone's <laughs> uh, Did Jane come from a wealthy family in the uh, in the movie universe? Well, Who knows? as the movie universe, I couldn't tell you that one. Mm -hmm. In in the book universe, her her dad was a professor, and she herself had some scientific uh, background. Yeah. Uh, so but they, uh, because yeah, because he's a professor doesn't mean he had he had any money to speak of. Well, no, well there, 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 was, there was a trunk. There was a trunk of money. 
in, in Tarzan yeah. the Apes book. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the treasure they found, Tarzan yes. gets it back to them at the end to save them from financial right. ruin. Right. That's what so, I was referring to. It said trunk so, of yeah. money. It was really a treasure. Yeah. I had the impression there had been money in the family in the past. So, but I don't know if he ever overtly says that. But but again, I, I see the, 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 I see, not to impose my beliefs on anyone, but I see the movie Tarzan and the book Tarzan as being different people. Oh, I, I agree. I think you have to go that way. They're just too different. Um, and now here, here Jane, Jane, a, a boy rather, boy needs a spanking for, I'm sorry, I keep saying boy needs a spanking, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but he, he's, he's overtly lying to Tarzan, who, who apparently is illiterate. And, he's got his yeah, fingers crossed. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so it doesn't count that he's lying now. Where did he even learn that? So, but, but we did see Tarzan uh, examining the letter in the, yeah. in the prior movie, and we will see that again in this movie. And yeah. he does show, he, Tarzan, does show he can read some and understand mm. and comprehend some. Okay. It just is interesting. And Jess, I agree completely that they had a great father son relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but it is interesting that both this movie and the previous one, Tarzan Triumphs, starts off with boy disobeying Tarzan about something. So, but I guess I think it's that boys. sort of Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn type yeah. of uh, mis well, mischief. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a very good point. And and actually, from a from a fictional from a writing fiction standpoint. Uh, things are more interesting when things go wrong. The story's more interesting too. when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a nice use of the, the map that he's going to pull out in a minute to give us a sense of the geography of where the story is going to take place. You know, we, we know they've got to go out into the desert and um, we're going to see where the city is and where the, the oasis or small jungle with the jungle fever uh, plants in it. Um, so it's it's a nice way to set up the story and give us a better sense of what's going on. That's, that's another snack item for a Tarzan movie, Jungle Jungle Fever. Jungle veggies. Fever plants. <laughs> so, uh, but I do like the justification for all this. So Jane, Jane wrote that there were troops who had served in Burma who were sick from the jungle fever they caught there. So here's this medicine Tarzan knows how to make that can help them. And Within the Tarzan universe, that's all very reasonable. It's it's a perfectly acceptable thing to set the story up. Uh, to a uh, perfectly acceptable way of setting up the story, I should say. Well, and in the real world, there are such things as uh, plants for medicinal purposes from mm -hmm. from uh, obscure uh, points in the world. Yep. Um, now, if, if the escarpment is in the north part of the, it makes you wonder where Tarzan's jungle is. They, they're they in the jungle, but if they march what looks like southeast, they hit the Sahara Desert? Or is that just another separate little desert? So Maybe he's got his map upside down. He might. So. Well, the original title for the movie was something like a, uh, Tarzan um, versus the Sahara Desert or whatever. Oh, okay. They had Sahara in the title. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the map might not have been to scale either. So he, they, they could have been traveling for weeks to get to the jungle. Now, right there, I, I believe Tarzan was stuffing that letter into his. Uh, okay. His... Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I've been assuming he was illiterate, but I think he's like checking up on what the letter says. And boy, being a boy, just doesn't think ahead um, about about the fibs he tells. Like Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes. That was some, some fancy dancing by Cheetah. There, so. It was. Mm -hmm. and, and Cheetah does a couple of other things, which I find it's going to be terrible for me to say, sacrilegious perhaps. I find <laughs> Cheetah to be a nuisance sometimes. But Cheetah does do some things uh, that require some talent in this movie. Mm -hmm. So here we meet the the people of the city and we meet the bad guys. So. Um, and the, the dialogue here, the interplay between the prince and the main villain um, kind of establishes their characters, you know? Um, that, you know, you know, the prince is suspicious of him at least. 
and that this guy, whatever he's up to, he's in it for the money. Right there on film, there was Joe Sawyer, mm -hmm. who did some 200 movies and TV shows, oftentimes as a villain. Um, and he plays a significant villainous role in this movie. Go ahead. You had something to say? Oh, I was just going to add to that. It's just there are some character actors who just did villain roles well. And that's, what, mm -hmm. that's how they made their living. You know, who am I going to mm -hmm. murder this time? Right. Well, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard it said that back when Westerns were the thing, Mm -hmm. that movie actors would, would suit up and so, you know, some of the people just did the that were just in a scene might mm -hmm. have one line to say if they were lucky but they would they would dress for their western role they would just walk from once one stage or from one theater one filming theater to another one just to stand in uh during a shot mm -hmm. and there were certain actors that you just you, you, you would see them doing pretty much the same thing in different movies, and you had expectations from them. You knew that guy was going to be a prospector. You knew that guy was going to be a sheriff. You mm -hmm. knew someone else was going to be a um, uh, be a uh, an outlaw because you'd seen them do that in the previous movie. Yeah, I think it was an aspect of the studio system back then. Actors usually signed contracts with a specific theater, mm -hmm. and were just or a specific studio, and were told what um, what uh, what roles they what movies they would be in, and they would get reputations for being able to play a particular part well, and that's what they would be asked to do. Um, this uh, village square that they're in, and the whole village here, mm -hmm. was originally built for a silent uh, epic like King of Kings or one of those. Um, and it was very expensive when they first built it, but they reused it in dozens upon dozens of movies, they said it repaid for itself many times over for yes. for the use they got out of it for movies like this that was very common the first um flash gordon serial with buster crab used reused sets from frankenstein and the bride of frankenstein very effectively so that that was a you know a very common thing to reuse sets and it just made sense yeah. to do it and still is but it's interesting how old some of these are some are yeah. sets I, when I worked at, at Universal, I think it's stage 27, still had part of the uh, Lon Chaney Phantom of the Opera uh, um, set in it. Oh, cool. And they were, and when I was there, they used it for Battlestar Galactica, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's some cool stuff. Now, this scene, like Tarzan objects to animal cruelty, which I think is awesome and a, mm -hmm. a, great, a great way to define him as a good guy. That was one heck of an arrow shot there. Um, but you know, just coming in and saving the horse, saving the horse from being abused, the horse is going to attach itself to Tarzan, even though he gives it its freedom. And it reminds me of how the Lone Ranger got Silver. You know, he actually saved him from a buffalo yeah. in a fight, and he said, "You know, I'd love that horse, but he's got to run free." And then Silver uh, willingly came up, came back to the Lone Ranger, and became his mount. So we have a very similar. Very similar uh, um, occurrence here. And there are instances in the Burroughs books of Tarzan and Burroughs' other heroes be befriending animals. Of course, mm -hmm. John Carter and Woola quickly comes to mind. I'm thinking yeah. right now, back to the Stone Age, where Von Horst uh, yes. befriends a, the mammoth Old White, when no one could tame Old White. No, Old White was notorious for killing people, but Von Horst uh, helped him. Uh, he was injured. There might have been a thorn or something. But but my horse helped him overcome the injury, and Old White remembered that they became best mm -hmm. buddies later on. Yeah, um, it's a very common. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of the heroes in the Burroughs books have really awesome pets, mammoths and hyena dons, as well mm -hmm. as you know cool dogs and horses and such. And that idea that animals respond to kindness um, and become loyal to you because of that is a very common theme in Burroughs's work. You're right, and that's exactly what John Carter said in his approach to uh, mm -hmm. to taming um, his um, oh, one of his mounts. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, the the zipper, the, uh, the thoat. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking thoat. Yep. Um, Whereas the yeah. green Martians were notorious to being for being cruel to the animals, 
mm. John Carter approached it with kindness and the animal responded very quickly. Yep. Actually, one of our mini podcasts, one of the early ones, one or two, is about uh, the pets in the Burroughs universe. Right. So I and you know, refer people to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to remark about the Tarzan out here wandering around the desert barefoot. The sand's got to be hot. <laughs> yeah. Weissmiller doesn't say a thing about you. He's yeah, always no. thinking, I should have wore shoes. He mm -hmm. always thinking that. Well, of course, maybe when we're not seeing their feet, Maybe they 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 put some like slippers on. Well, there is a there is a photo someplace of Weissmuller with some kind of shoes on, mm -hmm. um, and w with his Tarzan gear. It was off. It was uh, I think the photo was taken when they were not filming, <laughs> but uh, but I, was, I mean the reality of the situation is that sand's going to be and the desert's going to be hot. Yeah, reminds no, me no of no uh, sunscreen. <laughs> Peter, right. Cushing, P Peter Cushing playing Grand Moff Tarkin in the first Star Wars movie was wearing bunny slippers. Um, <laughs> uh, made it apparently very hard for Carrie Fisher to treat him as a bad guy. Uh, th these areas in the desert here, these were filmed out <laughs> close to Lone Pine, California, mm -hmm. where they did a lot of Lone Ranger and uh, Gunga Din, and, and there's an area out there by Lone Pine and the, the desert and bottom below uh, Mount Whitney and stuff that uh, uh, they call them the Alabama Hills and then mm -hmm. they have the sand dunes nearby, which is really a fun place to visit anyone's there. I didn't realize uh, originally Tarzan had been filmed out there when I'd, I'd been down there before. I do like the use of the Tarzan scene, Tarzan mm -hmm. kind of a fish out of water type thing, although He's mm -hmm. in the desert and return of Tarzan and other books, but now the, it's, that act, it's nice. That actor on the left, John Daner, uh, is someone you can recognize from a million movies and TV shows as a character actor. He was also very big in radio, an excellent radio actor. It's one of his very early roles. So, and he's only in it for a second, but just I'm a big fan of old time radio. And so yeah. I just think it's kind of cool to see him there. So. Bug your book. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, I've written books about old time radio, by the way. So everyone go out and buy it and make me rich beyond the dreams of avarice. So, <laughs> but we establish here that Connie Bryce is a vaudeville person, but she's agreed to do this little spy thing and get that message hidden in her bracelet to, uh, to Prince Salim in the city to warn him about the bad guys. You know, we've seen that the prince has his sufficient suspicions about the bad guys, but. Um, this this would be proof um and so we get you know connie's kind of sharp-witted way of talking and um you know the where the message is and that it's you know kind of shows that she's got some guts that she's willing to do a spy a spy mission or even a, just a message delivery mission even if she's not a full-fledged spy even though her main gig is uh, doing magic and uh, as a vaudevillian. Now in this scene, I think we, we do have to note that the Arabs are done in kind of a stereotypical manner, and it's fair to note that. Um, I think some of their dialogue though is kind of funny. So there's that as well. They are three of the scruffiest looking guys you've ever seen though, aren't they? <laughs> Well, I, and with that thought in mind, I would imagine they were intended to alarm the audience. Yeah. Yeah, you were supposed to think they were they were going to do something to her, so it's funnier when they just want to see your magic show. Right. 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 I mean, they've been out in the desert all day. There's no place to get cleaned up. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. And just the, you know, his speaking English with the words out of order a bit because he just doesn't speak English well is um it uh, the actor does it well it's you know it's not hilariously funny but it's kind of funny and it gives him kind of a a little bit of character to him very good yeah that's where they got the idea for yoda yeah <laughs> he's yoda's dad so <laughs> We're about um, the 18 minute mark on the timestamp. Yeah, okay. Um, and of course, Tarzan is going to be jumping in here in a minute to, um, to, to quote unquote save her from being cut in half. 
which I, I think is kind of a fun way to introduce her to the ape man. Tar Tarzan, the isolationist, comes to a rescue. Yes. <laughs> Well, this, and this film does have some humor, which is fine. I, I enjoy, I certainly enjoy, enjoy humor in my stories. Um, but it does get turned up a notch later on here, and I'll, I'll say when. I don't want to spoil it right now. Yeah. We, we do learn how these sawing someone in the middle tricks work. Yeah. Yeah, she's got the the fake legs out there with her. <laughs> the tar I saw just one of the these field. where they did it with, uh, where they did it with the, uh, like five blades, uh, sheet blades that went through like four places in the box. And then for like twice what it paid to go in and see that done, you can come up and see how they did it. And after uh, I saw the trick behind the uh, illusion. I was so ticked off that I paid the money to see because <laughs> it's <was> so basic. <laughs> There's no, no refunds, huh? No. Uh, yeah. It's interesting they showed you how it was done. I would think that would be the last thing they'd want to do. Yeah, you know, just one of those three-day carnivals that come through town. Yeah, uh, okay. But that probably spawned a bunch of backyard magicians mm -hmm. <laughs> working on their sewing techniques. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you idiot. That's just. Um, and of course, they get to kind of like each other after a while. But I think it's what I, what makes this character worthwhile for the one movie is the actress does give her a lot of personality, but she does get kind of a, a rapport with boy more than you know, I don't think they ever tried for any sort of romantic attachment with Tarzan, but she just gets this kind of motherly instinct towards boy, which I think throws shows through several times, which I think works really well. Uh, on, yeah. the, on, the, on the romantic counter, I spotted one thing, which I'll mm -hmm. try to point it out here later on. But not, yeah. that's, that's nowhere near the number that we saw with the previous movie. Yeah. And once again, G was Tarzan. Jane's not dead. She's just away for a while. So. And, and boy, quit encouraging things. I know. <laughs> you will get that spanking Tim wants to give you. Yes. Well, that didn't work. Nope. Roy Smeller has a good laugh. I'll, I'll say that. I like hearing him laugh. He does. It's very hearty. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, there's uh, Cheetah being Cheetah again. He runs off with the bracelet. Uh, right. But if Cheetah hadn't picked it up, we'd have had a problem. Or Nancy yeah. would have had That's a problem. That's true. That's true. I, I said Nancy. Uh, or, your character's name is Connie. Yeah. Um, Actually, so it's both movies. In the first one, he gets fixated with the coil to the radio set. And in this uh -huh. movie, he gets fixated with the bracelet. Um, so uh, Cheetah keeps getting fixated with a, a key plot device in every movie. So, I think, I think, I'm trying to find, I, I know I wrote this down, but I think this might be Cheetah's best role, this movie right here. Mm -hmm. So far as being integral to the plot, and Cheetah's always done uh, necessary things in addition to being adding comic relief is always like running at Tarzan's knife or things of that nature, or go tell someone things of that nature. But um, Cheetah does things too that are necessary to move the story along and make sure things turn out okay. Mm -hmm. And keeping well, tabs on the bracelet is, is a big part of that. Yeah. There's Tarzan cooking his meat, so we know this is definitely not the same universe as the, <laughs> uh, as the book Tarzan. Hey, 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 well, if you thought that the audiences were shocked at Tarzan not being married, how would they have reacted? To They're meeting raw meat. raw meat. That's true. Now, this is movie audiences, not book audiences. Mm -hmm. I think there might be a slight difference there. There probably is. I wonder what fans of Burroughs' books, because there were a lot of them. He was extremely popular. Oh, uh, yeah. Those who read the Tarzan books, I wonder how they reacted to the movie at the time. Um, they were obviously very popular with the general public. I wonder if you had borough files just always stopping from the theater in anger because 
Tarzan couldn't speak in complete sentences. Well, I've, I've, I've tried to go back and, and look because there's a lot of writings uh, from the time period available. And the, there certainly were people who, who, who uh, I don't want to say objected to the movies, mm -hmm. but were, I don't really want to say disappointed, but recognized that was a different Tarzan than we had in the books. Yeah. I think they were probably, but the movies are entertaining. They are. Uh, I, mean, I love movies. the Weiss Miller films, for example, mm -hmm. and several, several others. Uh, yeah. Recognize that it's a character that's akin to the book Tarzan, but it's not exactly the way Burroughs described. Mm -hmm. Was it Tarzan and the Lion Man where Burroughs makes fun of the movies? Yes, uh, definitely. Yeah, Tarzan, he goes to Hollywood, he gets told he's not right for the part where they're making a Tarzan movie, and then... Uh, that's exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's Burroughs taking a swipe at the film industry. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Burroughs was, he became an expert on marketing, so as long as the movies made him money and kept the pop the, the character in the in the public's eyes. I I think he probably accepted it from a business point of view. Right. I think I think that's a very good point because Tarzan very much used to be a household name. Every, everyone knew something. Mm -hmm. knew the basics about the character. Yeah. Uh, it was just one of those things you knew from a very early age and was yeah. generally present in, in in on television when they came along or through movies and mm -hmm. you had your, your comic strip. Not to mention comic books. Yeah. It was um, the writer Harlan Ellison once wrote that the three characters every single member of Western civilization will know are Tarzan, Superman, and Mickey Mouse. Very good. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Even if they've never read the original stories for any of those, they'll know who they are in their basic backstory. Well, let me oh, point so out that, excuse me, I just ahead. want to say that in this, on our movie here, we just saw Hendrix, who is Paul Hendrix, played by Otto Kruger. Who is the who will be the main villain in this movie? Go ahead, Scott. You had something. Uh, I was just going to say you're talking about the marketing because um, in between, I think the MGM movies and this, uh, the RKO, uh, Burroughs had got his hands in a little bit. I think with uh, 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 the Bix movie or uh, one of them, where where it was way he imagined Tarzan to closer to be. And, but it didn't make that do that well at the box office. So after these two movies were made here, uh, Sol Lesser sent them a script for uh, Tarzan and the uh, either Amazons or Mermaids. Mm -hmm. And uh, Burroughs told him, I appreciate you letting me see this first. He says, but I have no need to read it. He goes, obviously, you know what you need to do for your movies and I'll continue to do what I need to do for my books. But he made a quarter of a million dollars on, on uh, Ty Tarzan Triumphs as a, mm -hmm. a, a movie. So he was happy about that. Okay. So, um, I don't know, was, was Tarzan subdued a little too easily there, you think? He was, I know he was overwhelmingly outnumbered. And he tossed a few of the bad guys around before they caught him. But um, it didn't, didn't seem like it took much to capture him. But, saying all, uh, the bad guys should have worked, all the bad guys should have worked harder? Yeah, they should have worked harder. But uh, anyway, this is, I think, like, you know, he tells Connie to take care of Boy, and she's sort of reluctant about it. But I think this is where her she starts to establish that rapport with Boy that makes her a likable character. Meanwhile, Hendrix here has contacted her, and he sent her off with uh, Carl Strader, played by Joe Sawyer, our favorite villain. <laughs> And Tarzan stuck in jail. Yep. And uh, the horse Janer, they named him. Is now a prisoner. But he'll still, the, the horse will still be a plot point later on, I know. And they really, I think they do a good job of establishing the character dynamics here. You know that Prince Salim just doesn't tr trust Hendrix at all, but can't get his father to see that the guy is, is you know, basically dishonest. He doesn't know what his plan is, which I believe turns out to be to use the border tribes to just take over eventually. But um, he knows that he's up to no good. He just can't get his dad to see it. Um,
So just some plot development here. They're going to have to come up with a plan. She needs to get into see Salim to give her message. And then also, um, once they get Salim on their side, they can get Tarzan out of jail. So it's a reasonable plan. She just has to get into see Salim without Hendrix, the bad guy, knowing it. And I guess that's going to lead to Cheetah going into show business, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so we're at the 30 minute mark on the timestamp. Okay. For this movie, that's close to halfway, isn't it? Because I think this is an hour, six minutes. Sounds about right. It's pretty close to 70 minutes as I remember. Yes, you're, right. Yes, you're yeah. right. And um, I guess if you live in a small out of the way desert town, this would probably be, you'd probably just be entertained by anything that came through that was different. Well, I lived in a small out, I grew up in a small out of the way town out in the hills. And mm -hmm. if we saw something like that, man, we'd be, we'd be enchanted for a week. No, well, there you go. Chimpanzee doing, doing a tight tightrope walk. Just mm -hmm. seeing a chimpanzee would be something. <laughs> I read somewhere once. I don't know if we if this is something anybody wants to hear, but that um, chimpanzees can't be potty trained. So I just wonder if they occasionally had to do a different take, because um, Cheetah decided to let go at an inopportune moment. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's very possible with any animal in a movie. Yeah, always be, always be careful where you step. Yeah, particularly if you're, particularly if you're barefoot. That, that almost certainly happened with the elephant and uh, the elephants sometimes when they used elephants. Now, now here our, our the young fella is uh, talking to his dad about the mm -hmm. uh, oh about the villain uh, Hendrix. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's setting up things. They mentioned that he pays the local people a penny for doing, you know, pennies for doing labor. But mm -hmm. he's got all these border tribe people working directly for him. So mm -hmm. it, is, it just sets up the believability of the plan he has, which is eventually to use the border, border tribes to take over. In America, he'd be called a racketeer. Mm-hmm. It's... Um, yeah, I've been, before I watched this the other day in preparation for this, it had been years since I've seen it. I wrongly remembered them being Nazis, maybe because it was a wartime uh, film. But they're not. They're just kind of independent bad guys, aren't they? Right. Right. Cheat the chimpanzee with the human mind. <laughs> These guys are acting like they've never seen a chimpanzee before either. That's true. They actually, well, it's, it's the desert, so they might not see them that often. But if they do see them, they're probably not that well trained. Okay, this is, he, she, she knew that Salim had gone to Yale. So this, I think, is a clever little trick here. She sings the, the Yale fight song in order to get Salim's uh, attention. And sets it up when she gets a message or, or originally when she says Bula Bula to him mm -hmm. in the desert, too. Yeah, that's true. I didn't catch that before till today. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would I would imagine that the that the Yale students and, and graduates and alumni just love this, but I wonder what the Harvard people thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder if that song was copyrighted. Did they have to pay a fee to be able to use it? Because you know, B movies generally worried about their budgets and everything. Yeah. Well, it was not unusual, particularly during during this time period, to have a song of some kind in a movie. Abbott and Costello, again, I keep referring to them, but they're a favorite mm -hmm. of mine. They yeah. oftentimes had the Andrews Sisters or someone of that nature doing a song or two in, in their movies. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there would be copyright concerns, no question about it. Uh, but um, I, I, my belief is that all, that the 
studios felt the audiences almost expected a little music in their movie. I think that's true. I mean, you know, the Marx Brothers also is another example. They'd break from their comedy routines for, um, for you know, Harpo to do a, 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 a harp um, yeah. concert or a, or a female character to sing a song. It happened quite a lot in a lot of different movies. Is this where they're uh, getting ready to do uh, voice prayers? Yes. Yeah, they are. And... So, but I do, you know, I do like that. I, I'm sorry, I keep harping on it, but I do think that her rapport with Boy um, is is what makes her as much of a likable character as she is. Because at this point, it's like she, she, I think at this point, she's, you can almost see her consciously deciding she's not just stuck with Boy, but she really just wants to make sure he's all right. Bringing out her mother instincts, how about that? Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Basically, that's it. And I think this is the moment where it happens. Before then, he'd been kind of a, just a, a liability. Tarzan had stuck her with him. But now um, it's like he's one of the family, and she's going to watch out for him. And we are about the 36-minute mark, give or take. I'm giving the timestamps to help people sync up with where we are. Oh yeah, no, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Now, okay, so now she's getting brought to, she's gonna get brought to Salim. Um, did the um, the bad guy had seen something to make her suspicious, make him suspicious of her, right? Or is, did he just happen to be outside by chance? I think they were watching her for whatever reason. Yeah. And they, and they certainly saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they had mentioned earlier they had already stopped several other messengers. So they might have been suspicious of anybody from the outside who came into the village. Yes, at least two other messengers were killed yeah. or disappeared. So that makes sense. It's once again, B-movie plots, generally they hold together. And um, uh, there's very rarely a noticeable a plot hole in these films. I there was Hendrix that. hiding in the shadows just then. Mm -hmm. And then Cheetah following along. Oh, the remark I was going to make, again, it's going to sound critical. I really don't mean it to, but I, I think I think when a boy and, and the young lady there were doing the prayers, that mm -hmm. perhaps the audience was praying also that something would happen. Well, something is about to happen mm -hmm. here. Okay, so she's finally going to get her message to Salim, but it's not going to do Salim a lot of good. He's about it's so to... strange to see people smoking in movies. Yeah, you know, and of course, to be fair, they didn't know it was bad for you back then. This is still. Oh, oh I real, I realized that. You know, that's, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember that was a normal thing. Mm -hmm. But these days, it's, it's fairly rare. Yeah. Now that's the bracelet there with the secret message inside. Mm-hmm. And Cheetah might just be tagging along because of her obsession with with this uh, with this bracelet. Yeah, that's true. Which works out to, to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But this message will be it's important already. It'll be even more important later on in the film. Mm -hmm. There are yeah, because because yeah, because Salim's dad just is completely taken in by the bad guys. Um. So they, they need that note as proof that they are that, that they are indeed villains. And it's uh, should be noted that Connie does her job of delivering the message, but still 
um, is loyal to her word of boy and makes sure she speaks up for Tarzan as well. Very good. True. <clears throat> It's too bad Cheetah can't uh, um, testify in court. He sees the whole thing, doesn't he? So, actually, he could testify in court because Tarzan could translate for him. I'm not sure a judge would accept that as legitimate testimony. Which reminds me, there's a scene later on about translating, which I'll, I hope you remember to, to point it out. I thought it was so funny. But I don't want to spoil it now. Good thing, good thing that message has a handy carrying case to be in the bracelet. Yeah, it does. He's, he's, he's a forgetting damage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, props to Salim. He's dying there, probably in agony, but he still uh, keeps his head enough to, um, to fake burning the message so the bad guys don't know it's still out there. Well, I have these noble thoughts for myself. I just don't think I can come across with that in my last moments. I think I'd be more, more concerned with heading to the great beyond, wherever that is. Yeah. Probably burn my, burn my fingers on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> and the, like, the villains are quick thinking too, aren't they? They're going to they're gonna quickly frame uh, Connie for, for the murder. So they're going to cover for themselves. A so successful they villain does not miss an opportunity. That's true. So they think the message has been destroyed and um, now they can get rid of Connie by accusing her of a murder and they've tied up, as far as they know, they've tied up all their loose ends. So this is where I was saying the pace of the film picks up. Now that we've, we've had a murder and we've mm -hmm. got Connie being accused for it, Tarzan's already in jail. So mm -hmm. things are looking pretty grim for our heroes. Yeah. Yeah, this movie, if I had to compare the two, I would say Tarzan Triumphs is probably a little better uh, because there are moments, you, you know, it's what a 70 minute film, but there are moments like when she was doing her magic, magic trick in the Oasis and other moments where, mm -hmm. you know, they probably could have picked the pace up a little bit and moved things along a little faster than they did. Mm -hmm. And well, again, it's almost like it. two movies mm -hmm. because of the, the still have the special jungle uh, medicine to get too. Yeah. That's a good point. That, that is a good point. Uh, having to get that medicine almost becomes secondary for a while because you got these people in prison and the, and the murder charges. Yeah, it does become a plot point though when they all get away, they can't just go for help for somewhere right away. They still have to get the jungle medicine. So right here we're watching the uh, inquiry as to uh, the motivations and what happened to lead to Prince Selim getting killed. Mm-hmm. And it's done well, I think. I think the bad guys are shown to be smart. You know, the judge isn't dumb or corrupt or anything. It's that the bad guy is clever enough to present the, uh, the slanted evidence in such a way as an honest judge might honestly think she's guilty. You all think the judge had a golf appointment that afternoon so he kind of pushed things along? <laughs> that I'm could be happy. true too. I might be giving the judge a little bit too much credit here. Um, of course, certainly there's no appeal, is there? I don't see legal counsel either. That's true. Yeah. Um, and in many of these countries, even up today, but especially back then in uh, Middle Eastern countries, a woman's word meant nothing. That's true. Two men too. saying something, it becomes becomes like a complete guilty law. That's true. Yeah. I, yeah, I have to say, I think I was giving the judge a little bit too much credit there. I like how Boy talks his way into the jail cell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this guard is trying yeah. to do his duty. Finally, gives in. Let's Boy in. Yeah, it's too bad they have to knock him out in a few minutes, right? Um, they, they knock him out or do something to him because he we don't hear another peep out of him after yeah. that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost too bad because he does actually seem like kind of a nice guy here.
I like I wonder, that word slick framing. Yeah. I, I wonder how Boy learns all this slang. You know, he knows Staying what a frame is. Yeah, you're yeah. right, because he's so young when they found him. Yeah, he's been growing up in the jungle, but he, he says G earlier and um You're right, uh, that's yeah. a good point. You know, Chris he did they just brought, spend they spent a little time in New York in one movie, so which came prior to this. Yeah. Well, it might be all that distance mm. learning on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know what kind of Wi Fi would um would Tarzan have in his treehouse. <laughs> Yeah, he'd he'd have to have a pretty powerful router. Well, che cheetah's outside riding a bicycle, generally electricity. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, right here, Tarzan is speaking in Tarzan speak and mm -hmm. uh, about what he wants Cheetah to do, and Boy steps in and tells him in English. <laughs> it's a, it's a lot better with the sound on, but I mean, I thought that was so amazing. Boy's never mm -hmm. had to interpret for Tarzan before. And shouldn't cars and shouldn't um Tita know jungle speak better than he knows English? So. I don't I don't know. I I don't ever recall seeing that in any more any other films. Mm -hmm. So but but that, it came off to me as being very humorous. It, yeah, and it might have been a moment where they didn't quite trust the audience enough to get it. So they figured we better have boy repeat it in English. Well well, yeah, yeah I think you could be right. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Because sometimes even um and this is actually his stealing the turbans from various people. Actually, I think they do kind of generate some good humor out of this. I agree. Mm -hmm. That fellow was sitting there eating an apple. I don't know in these days how plentiful apples were. In the I, I assume it was an apple. Perhaps it's another form of fruit. It looked like an apple to me. But Yeah, but, actually, that's, that's probably not the appropriate uh, fruit for this time and place. Um, I don't know for sure, though. So Cheetah's developing a collection of headgear. He is. Oh, there's some good scenes coming up here where he is uh, caught in the act mm -hmm. um, of stealing and then freezes. It happens a couple times. Right, th right through there. Mm -hmm. Look up. Look up. There he is. <laughs> and, then, and then we'll get another dose of that here in a moment. That is, yeah. <laughs> Where'd he go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's at the 47 minute mark on time. Yeah, okay. I wonder if uh, Tarzan and Connie went back and paid everybody for their turbans later on. <laughs> Probably left the turbans all tied up hanging out of the window. <laughs> I, yeah, I, what, I always, always, from this systems analysis standpoint, I always say, is there an easier way to do this? And they spent all night collecting these turbans. And meanwhile, the gallows is being built out here. So time is growing yeah. short. Couldn't yeah, I actually, is there any reason? I mean, the book Tarzan would have been out that window climbing down the, the decorations on the tower in, a, in, a, in half a second. I agree yeah. totally. He would have been. No matter how good the footholds and handholds are, he'd gone down that tower. Yes, he would have. And I also wonder if there's any way to send Cheetah around, even the long way, to go to go go back in the building through the front door, come up the steps, and get the keys from the um, from the guard who's laid out there on the floor. <laughs> that might have been quicker than stealing all these turbans, but the turbans was much better visually. It would have been a would have been a funny scene for them to pull off this escape, and then Boy asked Tarzan why they didn't just do that, you know, send <laughs> Cheetah out for the keys, <laughs> Tarzan. You know, dope slaps him and said, why didn't you suggest that two hours ago? So, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Chris, we've, we've all had the moments where we've done something in a complicated way and then immediately after thought of the easy way, haven't we? Always, for me. Mm -hmm. 
And see, with those bricks, Tarzan would have just used those yeah. like, rock he, he, climbers do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's definitely not the book Tarzan. Now that we're out here, what do we do? Oh, there's a horse. Mm -hmm. I like this scene. Uh, it's neat seeing Tarzan with uh, horses mm -hmm. or using oh. them as opposed to some of the other jungle animals. Doesn't mm -hmm. he whistle right there? Yeah. Uh, Roy Roger style or cowboy style? Um, oh, I don't remember. I'll have to watch it again with the sound up. Uh, yeah, uh, there is. It's an interesting right whistle he horse. does. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the one that Roy Rogers would use to summon Trigger? Exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. exactly. So maybe that's horse language. Well, he didn't have boy translating for him this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I marked that in my notes at the 49 minute, 35 second mark where okay. Tarzan whistles like Roy Rogers. There they go. There's a doorway up here that um, Tarzan and um, Connie and right there, they just squeeze the two horses, squeeze through that doorway. Mm -hmm. It looks to be pretty snug fit. Mm -hmm. Well, whoever they did have, whoever they had doing the stunt riding, did a good job. That was just an impressive scene. That the horse stampede. They did a great job on the scene coming up with the. Uh, uh, sandstorm too. Mm -hmm. It has that realistic look to it or feeling to it. Um, it does. The sandstorm scene is very, very good. Um, I, a comment I was going to make back when uh, we were gathering up the turbines, um, when Cheetah came back with the turbines, someone could have said, what took you so long at the store? <laughs> <laughs> I would presume they just had some fans off camera um, to do this, but the effect is good. It really, um, uh, really gives the impression of them being stuck in a sandstorm. Yes. I agree, it's very effective. I'm gonna throw out a quick shot here while we're watching this scene, just a People are listening and enjoying this type of commentary. A uh, couple books here to recommend for them. Uh, David Lemel's Tarzan, Jungle King of Popular Culture. Uh, Gabe Essel's Tarzan of the Movie. And Scott Tracy Griffin's Tarzan on Film. Uh, they all have uh, nice little insights and uh, information about the movies like this that audience yeah. might like to uh, check with if they don't already have them. <laughs> Great, great point. Those are all, all very high on my ERB reference list. Mm -hmm. They're all good books. Um, I know it's egotistical, but I'm going to mention that Lummel quotes one of my books in his book. So. Yeah, he did. <laughs> uh, Tim, you had an observation as they go into this uh, little hut here. I don't want to take your thunder, but I didn't want to forgotten. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that they should have like done something to care for the horses, brought them right. inside as well, or found shelter for them. They just kind of like forget the poor beasts out there. And, you know, of course, they're trying to do economic storytelling, but it's something in this case I think is noticeable, especially since we know Tarzan cares for animals. There's no way yeah. he would have left it just out there in the sandstorm. I mean, a scene wound up on the cutting room floor. It might have. Um, I think it might have been kind of cool if they'd brought the, the horses in through the doorway with them to get them to shelter. I, well, I agree. That would have been interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't have, wouldn't have taken a lot of time either. It wouldn't have interfered with the pace of the storyline. Yeah, she, the boy is inviting to, and of course, once again, he's got that kind of like mother th thing going on with her, so it's understandable. But boys... Uh, inviting another beautiful woman to come live with them. You know, I, I, I would be interesting to see Jane's reaction to that when she got home. Well, I imagine after Maureen O'Sullivan watched these two movies and heard all, heard all this, she no way she was coming back after that. <laughs> <laughs> you all don't appreciate me. I want to stay over here and do other things. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, by the way, I uh, on on the um, Gawa counter, I did not detect any of Gawas in this film. If you all hear it, please speak up. Okay. I meant to mention that at the beginning. Yeah. Now, of course, to be fair, when Tarzan went out to get something for them to sleep with, he could have seen to the horses. Good point. So, so it just might be something we didn't see. They didn't bother saying prayers this time. No, they didn't. Okay. Well, persistent bad guys, they managed to make it through the sandstone themselves. Now, this is the same hut, right? Yeah, they're gone by now, I think. Um, what, we would have to presume they had a little bit of dumb luck in finding them because um, they're... There'd be fresh prints there leading away, but the sandstorm would have blown away any tracks leading up to the to the hut. True. But if they knew the general direction they were going in, it's not that much of a stretch that they could have found them anyway. So we are about about the 50, 56 minute 56 mm -hmm. minute mark. <laughs> I do like the monkey a horse thief and accuse murderers. Yep, that is a good that is a good line. Um, and she wants to go right back to the Emir who sent her there, but Tarzan says no, we got to get the medicine. So they had seemed to have forgotten about the medicine for a while, but it is still an important plot point. Well, it's not unusual in the books to start out with a particular objective in mind. But mm -hmm. in getting from point A to point B to fulfill the objective, all kinds of stuff happens. Whole book, yeah. whole book worth yeah. of adventure happens in between. That that kind of reminds me of uh, Tarzan at the Earth's core, where they go down to rescue David Ennis. <laughs> but then the the whole book is, you know, Jason Gridley and Tarzan having their own adventures that have nothing to do with that. That that was exactly the book I was thinking of. Yeah, was, that was the one that came to mind. Mm -hmm. And and Von Horst is having adventures too. He gets separated at the same time. But that's true. He, that that's all told in you know, another book. Mm -hmm. Now this is all stock footage from one million uh, years BC, which was made by RKO in 1940. It's an early dinosaur movie. Um, the remake in the 60s used Ray Harrios in stop motion, but the original used uh, um, dressed up lizards photographically enlarged. And that stock footage was used in dozens of movies over the years, including this one. And I think in a way, it's kind of a shame that Tarzan sees dinosaurs, but he doesn't actually encounter, you know. Uh, he doesn't uh, interact. He doesn't interact yeah. with them at all. You know, it's kind of, why did they even put the dinosaurs here if they weren't gonna take, if they weren't gonna be a significant role in the, in the movie at all? And they're not. I think in the beginning they talk about the, uh, I think Boy mentions about the, uh, bizarre and strange creatures they say that are in yeah. the jung jungle with the mysterious thing but yeah. that's where it almost feels tacked on and getting the medicine is actually a red herring and mm -hmm. you begin with that and it'll be in, in the movie here but the real story was dealing with uh mm -hmm. and still in part dealing with the uh criminals the bad guys in the kingdom yeah planning to bring in uh border troops and, and take mm -hmm. more control now, of course, I was just critical of not using the dinosaurs, but now I've just realized there's a way to defend it. Uh, they're, 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 the dinosaurs are to establish that there are strange things in this jungle, so that when they encounter the man-eating plant and the giant spider, it's, you know, it, uh, they, they don't come out of nowhere. We've already established that there are weird monsters in this little jungle. Well, and those plants we just saw, they actually raise up and, and capture their victim. That's not something we see. Uh, that we've seen before in the Tarzan movies or since. Mm -hmm. So that, that in itself is somewhat unique. But I, I agree, my first thought is, man, you give me a, a dinosaur, let's have it do something. Yeah, um, but it's, it's probably, 
uh, you know, the low budget of the movie. They, they had stock footage that they could use for free because it was an RKO movie, mm -hmm. but the, to arrange for Tarzan to interact with them, they would have had to have filmed another giant lizard and right. somehow choreographed a fight with Johnny Weissmuller. I, oh, and, and I agree with you. And I, I'll even say that my, of course, I wasn't alive in 1943. Um, I may feel like it, but I wasn't. But uh, it, it's, uh, it, it could still have been a thrill for audiences to see just that little film clip. It's not something they saw every day. That's whereas, true. Whereas we've got Jurassic Park and all kinds of things are even more in depth than that. Yeah, that is true. Although I'd like to have. Uh, I'd be curious to see the movie where 10 minutes of it was with the village and 40 was with the dinosaurs. Because <laughs> yeah. Tarzan and dinosaurs are a great team up. Yeah. You know, what I was just thinking is the uh, King Kong and Son of Kong were RKO movies. They had stock footage of better looking dinosaurs than the lizards. Uh, that yeah. They used. That would, of course, that might have been made more disappointing that they didn't actually do anything. And, and I don't know if it would have affected that availability, but there was some effort to get a um, Tarzan Kong movie put together. Uh, oh, okay. that's, chronicled, that's chronicled in one of my books. Oh, it's uh, the, um, oh, heck, uh, it, it's the book about King Kong, the uh, fellow who created the King Kong, the original King Kong movie. It's described uh, in there. Willis O'Brien. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, I, and, I have, and I have read that, that he, that was one of his plans. Um, have either of you read Will Murray's book of Tarzan meeting King Kong? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I got a couple years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I like that too. I'd love to see that as a movie. Yeah, that would be a fun one. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. So here they've discovered the uh, bracelet and the and the message inside of it, realizing it, yep. it can clear our county of wrong, so, wrong yeah. doing, that the bad guys are indeed bad guys. Mm -hmm. And so our hearts is calling attention to something. Oh, there's bad guys coming. Mm -hmm. So cheetah's kleptomania serves a purpose there. That would be the one minute, right? One minute, one hour mark, mm -hmm. right, right, just now. Um, and if they had had Tarzan interact with, uh, he had his cool horse with him, Tarzan interacting with dinosaurs while riding that horse. Yeah. So could have made a wonderful scene if, you know, if the, if they'd had the budgets to do special effects. To the, the, pre, the prelude to Valley of Guanji? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's one of, <laughs> that, if, if I had to name my one favorite movie scene of all time, it would be trying to lasso the Allosaurus while on the, Cowboys on horseback trying to lasso the Allosaurus in Valley of Guanji. That is a great point. movie. Fun. That, it is. I agree totally. Great movie and great scene. Mm -hmm. I still have my comic book from that movie released back in the 60s. Cool. I think that was, was that Alex Toth artwork? I think. I uh, think, think you might be right. I haven't mm -hmm. looked at it in a little bit, but I don't remember completely, but it's a, it's a good, it's a good, uh, yeah. Book. And actually, while Tarzan triumphs, I think some more cohesive, straightforward movie. Mm -hmm. This desert mystery to me has a lot of elements where I could see it being combined. I don't know with quite as much humor, but I could see the elements between the desert journey and the village and the uh, espionage type scene along with the jungle with the medicine and the dinosaurs uh, I think could be really nice as a big budget movie with the right script uh, uh, putting those things together. Yeah, you could have gotten, if they could afford it, uh, if they wanted to put the money into it and gotten Willis O'Brien for the stop motion, um, they yeah. could have done something really impressive. Now, I believe this is the first time we've seen a lion in this movie, which is kind of a rarity for a Tarzan film. I think you're right, though. Yeah. They, they haven't spent that much time in a jungle environment. Well, they had lioness earlier with, with the cubs. Yeah. That's true. Uh, good point. You're right. You're right. 
Oh, and and there's one takes, one bad guy down. Takes care of Joe Sawyer. Mm -hmm. He uh, appeared in several movies, as we said, and one of my favorites, the Evan Costello film, Naughty Nineties, where they do the um, oh. who's on first routine. Mm -hmm. He's been a bunch of other ones. Yeah, it's, it's skilled character actors like that who just really make is part of what makes the movies from the 30s and 40s and 50s as good as they are. Yeah. They, they always seem to have just the right guy to plug into the right part, even if it was a small part, to give the movie more personality. Uh, this is the cave I think one of you all asked about when we were talking about uh, reviewing this film. Somebody asked me about it. Mm -hmm. I've heard some people comment on this scene and the uh, webs and the spider here is kind of cheesy, but I, I love, I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, as, as I like to say, I have a vivid imagination. It doesn't take a lot. You, know, you throw a trash can on a fellow's head and call him a man from Mars, and I'm I'm all good. With it. I've always <laughs> oh, I way. I agree too. Um, yeah. I, I like old school Doctor Who and all of that where, you know, they don't have any budget at all for the special fix, but they're obviously trying hard and they're right. telling a good story. Let your, let your imagination fill in the gaps, even though yep. that spider is probably on wheels the way he was moving, mm -hmm. but uh, that's okay. He's a, he's, a, he's a big boy. He looks dangerous. So that's got my mm -hmm. attention. That's a healthy spider web too. That is now. I, I I would assume the spider has to go out to hunt sometimes because you can't depend on animals just wandering into its cave all that often. No. Now, meanwhile, Tarzan here has got himself up, up a creek, all wrapped up in this plant. Which was actually careless of him because he saw it earlier and obviously recognized it for <laughs> what it was. Exactly. He's been here before. Yeah. Fortunately, the, the, where do these elephants come from? That's what I wanted to know. We have not seen an elephant in this movie. Okay. That means we should have seen a dinosaur elephant fight like in Valley, Valley of Gwen. Oh, yeah. Now you're talking. Now you're talking. Yeah. That, they, would, all establish, these... that would establish the elephant. So we wouldn't yeah, be so or, or if they'd made these mastodons instead coming out. Now that would have been cool. That would have been cool. That would have been a perfect touch for this place. Um, yeah, it's like th this, this whole scene is cool and entertaining, but when you think about it, it's like it's full of all these lost uh, opportunities for doing yeah. something awesome. Now, I do like that Connie, she did a panic scream when she saw the spider, but she's still trying. She's trying to defend Boy by throwing rocks at it. Did you notice her style of throwing? I mean, she was overhand throw. I, I think she could be out there pitching for the Yankees. Look at her. She could. <laughs> maybe, maybe she played uh, like softball in school or something. League of their own. Mm, there we go. And uh, this may be the most gruesome end of, the, of any of the bad guys got in the movie. That can't be a pleasant way to go. Well, being the chief bad guy. Uh, yeah, he definitely deserves it. I, you know, we don't feel sorry for him, but that's just you know, smart and. In, in the last movie and in this though, for like a pie's, you know, a 12 year old boy going to movie theater in a small town mm. uh, during World War II, they got these heavy duty action scenes at the end mm -hmm. with the spider here, the other one with the lion in the pit. And if the rest of the movie had been slow when you're coming out as a kid, you'd be all energized though because, because of the big uh, ending and the uh, um, creatures they ran into. Mm -hmm. True, very true. R rushes to a big climax. Yeah. Well, I guess with the bad guys dead, they had no problem like getting that message back and proving everybody's innocence. And evil has been foiled. And these got they even specifically mentioned they have enough of the jungle medicine, so they tie up all the plot uh, plot points. And I think Connie's going to take it back to London for him. Mm hmm. Guessing this is the only place in Tarzan's history he's been called Pelzy Wellsy. <laughs> <laughs> So, Good point. Yeah, but uh, Connie, I think, was an okay one-shot character. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
rides off into the sunset. Mm -hmm. Tarzan, Tarzan still doesn't have a horse to go back to the desert. <laughs> Oh. Keep turbans. <laughs> Not a bad joke. Not as good as the Hitler joke, but still pretty good. So, okay, so that's it. Those That's Tarzan Triumphs from 1942 and uh, Tarzan's Desert Mystery from 1943. Um, and so we will... Uh, when, when I post this on the various sites we posted, I will make a point of noting the timestamp between the two movies. So uh, I, I imagine a lot of people listening to this might take, might listen to our commentaries on different nights. So we'll make sure it's easy for you to jump forward to get to the point where we start the, com the commentary on the second movie. I would certainly be interested in feedback for this and what people thought. It's a little different though. A little different um, uh, a technique and approach here to what we normally do. Uh, mm -hmm. I would liken it to Mystery Science Theater. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would welcome comments. I would we, always, we always want comments, but I would especially like some on this. Yep. And for those who don't own the DVDs, um, I stream these through Amazon. Uh, it cost me like two ninety nine a movie, which is a great price for wonderful movies like that. So, so you do have a source for watching it. Uh, just turn the sound down and the subtitles on and start our commentary at the right moment. And, um, and I agree with Jess. Let us know what you think. Uh, if this was worth doing, we will dedicate another podcast in the future at some point to doing it again. So any last comments on either of these movies or on the Weissmuller movies in general? Well, despite my being an armchair quarterback, I certainly enjoy the White Miller uh, films, all of them, and, and do highly recommend them. Mm -hmm. I think they're great entertainment. I grew up watching them. I still watch them periodically. We have discussions about them in my group uh, once in a while, and, and they're always very popular, highly regarded, and a, and a joy to remember. So it's a, it's a fun, always a fun trip for me to, to watch a White Miller film. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I think it's fairly safe to say that this is a different universe than the ERB universe, but it's a fun universe in its own right. And um, I don't it's know. a lot if, of fun. Yeah. And I think they were fortunate in having Weissmuller play the Me, Tarzan, You, Jane version of the character because he had the charisma and the personality to pull it off. Uh, the wrong actor might have killed the character in the movies right, right away. So, so um, Okay, then. Well, we will be back with another podcast soon. Uh, if you're listening to this when we first post it in September of 2020, uh, we are also doing a series of mini podcasts where we're analyzing the original Tarzan novel on a chapter by chapter basis. And uh, as just said, we would appreciate feedback. Uh, to, for We know that we have fans. We've gotten good reviews on iTunes, which we very much appreciate. Thank you for that. And we get good feedback from uh, both YouTube and, and Facebook and other places we post these, but we would love to hear more comments from people about uh, what you think of when we do something unusual like this and what you would like to hear us doing in the future. Um, so uh, once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Uh, you can find my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff and a link to my Amazon.com author page there. Uh, do you guys want to plug anything on the way out? Well, if I may, I'll put in a word for uh, for my daily activity, and that is for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs Facebook discussion group with Lola Pop. We are talking Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, and all of the ERB universe every day on Facebook for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. I just want to say thank you to those who are listening and watching, and please give us some feedback because um, I sure enjoyed this, and I hope. Uh, Whoever turns in, uh, tunes in will enjoy it too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep an ear out for uh, future episodes of the podcast, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>